Welcome to John Gates Games. Today, I'll be doing a full three-player playthrough of Outlive. Now, in this game, each player takes on the role of a leader of a small band of survivors in a post-apocalyptic nuclear wasteland. Every single day, you'll move your heroes around the surface, where they will try to hunt down animals for food, as well as gather supplies. And then, every night, you will take all this stuff downstairs and try to build out new rooms, repair equipment, and survive the best you can. Now, I'll be explaining how the game plays while we're actually playing it, but before we jump in, I would like to mention that if you enjoyed this video, uh, please consider clicking the like button down below, as well as the subscribe button. Also, this video was selected by the Patreons on my Patreon campaign. Uh, every month they vote for one of the playthroughs that I do, so if you'd like to check that out and learn about other ways you can support the channel, please go to johngetsgames.com support, and I'd really appreciate it. All right, without further ado, let's jump into the game. Out here in the middle of the table, we have the main board for the game. Now you'll notice that it has eight different locations spread around the perimeter, and you'll also notice that each player has four of these hero pawns in various spots. Now the reason they are heroes is because this is a treacherous overland where various materials and supplies need to be acquired, but it's certainly not a nice place to go. Uh, so these heroes are going to be moving around trying to get the stuff that the shelter needs. And speaking of which, let's now take a look at our shelter. As you can see on our player board, this essentially consists of a series of rooms that are subterranean. And at the beginning of the game, everybody starts with three of these basic rooms, but then we did a uh, selection process to get these four advanced rooms here, but I decided to do all of that setup before I turned the camera on. So other things we want to pay attention to are the radiation track right here. It's currently at zero, but the higher up it gets, the more points we lose until we potentially have our survivors actually die off. Also down here, we can see this leader card. Now, this is the leader for our colony. Her name is Lily Rose Welly, and this card tells us that we're going to start the game with three microchips. As you can see, they're stored right here. It also says we start the game with a backpack piece of equipment, but it is broken, and I'm going to show broken equipment down here below the board and the uh, functioning equipment up along the top. So we're going to probably try to repair this one as soon as we can because it's pretty good. And the last thing that this card shows us is the starting locations for our heroes out on the main board. Now, the last thing that I'd like to explain before we go into our first turn is how these various rooms work. Now, at the start of the game, each player is allowed to build one of their rooms for free, and we decided to do this one right here. The rest of our rooms are not currently constructed. As you can see, this little three in a gear means we'd have to spend three building materials to get these built in the night phase of the turn, but we're about to go into the day phase first before night comes. So since we were able to build this one automatically, we then had the ability to put up to four survivors in. This building only takes three survivor slots, so we put our overflow one over here into the airlock. Now, a room only activates its special ability if it is completely full of survivors, and you're never allowed to remove survivors from a room. So we've already got this one activated, so we're going to get the ability of empty cupboard. Whenever we pull an empty cupboard from searching cities, we actually gain wood and metal instead of getting nothing. Now, of course, we only get the use of this once per turn, and that applies to all of the rooms as well as the pieces of equipment. Also, if we look over here, we have an upkeep. It shows a two and then water, canned food, and meat. And this just means if we have at least one survivor in this room, we have to spend two of uh, any variety of these things at the end of the round. Now, if you notice these two dice up here, they don't actually come with the game. I'm just using them to help uh, myself remember what our upkeep needs are. So that's why I have this at a two to remind myself that right now we have to spend two at the end of the round. The last thing to point out is this airlock over here where our final survivor is. Uh, we're going to have to spend one water if there is any uh, survivors in this top row, and that's why I have this as a one right there. And people in the airlock are going to help us prevent gaining more radiation, which is certainly a good thing. All right, let's now go ahead and start the first round of the game. As you can see on this board right here, we have six different events, and there will be six rounds to the game before we end it and see who has the most points. The first thing we have to do on every round is flip over the top event. In this case, it looks like it's going to be wildfire. So the way these events work is they're going to give us, in general, a detrimental effect, and that effect will stay around until somebody actually removes this one at the end of the round. So over here with the wildfire, we see it says that we decrease the forest's wood supply uh, by a certain number based on the player count. This is a three-player game, so that means that three wood is going to be removed right now from the supply of wood for this turn and every future turn until the wildfire is put out by somebody spending three uh, water in the end of the round. And I'll explain how that works later on, but for now we have to go ahead and remove some wood. When we come up here to the forest, you'll notice that there are eight wood up here originally, and that's because, as you can see over here, it's a three-player game, so it's always going to get stocked back up to eight at the beginning of the round, or, I guess, uh, three less when the wildfire is going, so we have to go ahead and remove three of these so there is just less wood available for us to scavenge this round. At this point, it's now time to go into the movement phase for the round, and the way this works is that each player is going to activate one of their heroes that is currently idle or laying down, 
they're going to move it to a new spot, activate that spot, and then the next player is going to go in uh, clockwise order around the table. Once all players have moved all of their heroes and activated various spots, then we can move on with the round. So for now, we get to start because we are the starting player, and we have four of our heroes right here, and everybody is lying down, which means they all are options to move and activate. Now, there are a couple rules when it comes to movement, and the first one is that you're allowed to move the hero up to two locations around this circle right here. So that means if we wanted to, for instance, get over here to the forest, we could only get there with this three or this three because they could get there with two actions and these other two are too far away to get over there. Now, the next rule is that you're never allowed to move uh, onto a spot where you already have a, a hero of your color. That means we cannot start off by taking this five and moving over here because this four is already here. And this is an important thing because if you remember, we started the game with a, um, a, a room down below in our shelter that's going to make uh, scavenging in one of these two cities much better than for our opponents. That means we probably do want to do that scavenging, which means we probably want to move this four out of the way as soon as we can so that on a future turn we can move this five in over here and try to scavenge before um, other players come in here and try to scavenge those spots as well. So let's go ahead and start things off and move the four. And we have a couple different options. Uh, the first thing we do is they're going to stand themselves up when they move on to a new spot. And we could, for instance, move over here to the container ship. Uh, on this spot, you would have to put this down onto the location that matches the strength value. And if we went right here, we would get two cans of food, which is nice. And we would get another survivor for our shelter, which is going to allow us to activate more rooms, which is certainly good. Another option is we can move over here to the military facility and pick up some ammunition. Now this is important because other players, if they move into a spot where we have an activated hero and they have a higher strength hero, then they can actually put pressure on us and potentially take some of our resources. But this ammunition will help us actually fend them off or we could use this ammunition to hunt some of the wild animals that are scattered around the board. Now considering we start the game with no ammunition, I figure this is probably a good move for us. Once we land in a location, the first thing we have to do is check to see if we're going to apply any pressure onto any other heroes. Now, as I mentioned before, that's only going to happen if the hero we're activating has a higher strength value than an activated hero in the zone. Now, activated heroes are standing up, and right now, this is the only other hero, and it's laying down an idol. So we don't apply any pressure, so we don't need to worry about that. And now we can go ahead and do the turn. Now, the strength value of the hero is going to tell you how many actions you get to do in that location. So in this case, we can do four actions. Now, in the military facility, there are two different options. The first is we could simply grab ammunition. We have no limit to the number of ammunition we can have, so we could just grab four right now, and that's pretty good. But the other thing that we could do is we could spend one of our actions to flip over this radioactive algae pool right here. Now, this can be done, so done once per round, and if we were to do it, then none of our opponents would be able to. And this allows us to actually move our radiation track backwards, which is a really good way to do it. So I figure let's go ahead and spend our first action doing that, and our second, third, and fourth action grabbing three ammunition. As you can see on our shelter board, there's actually a spot to store all of the different resources in the game, like munitions, microchips, wood, uh, metal. Up here we have canned food and meat, which spoils between the rounds, and lastly, water can go over there. So we got our uh, munitions down here, and now we can take our radioactive uh, track and move it down into the plus one spot. And if the game was to end right now, that would get us one point, which is certainly nice. But uh, an even better reason to do this is because this will probably start drifting up, and the more this way we can go uh, when we have the opportunity, the better, I think, for us. Okay, well, with that, we're now done with our activation. So now the blue player gets to go, and they have decided they're going to pick up their level five right here and move it over to the forest. Once they land over here in the forest, they now have two different options to spend their strength points. Now, the first is really self-explanatory. They can just take a piece of wood uh, for each strength they spend on it. And the other is over here, and this is hunting wildlife. Now, the blue player actually started the game with a room that makes them uh, hunt better, and this is the reason they moved over here. Now, the way you hunt wildlife is you need to spend strength points equal to the number on the main part of that token. So in this case, the blue player has to spend three out of their five strength fighting this animal. This is going to kill off this animal, and they get to take this token, and then they're going to have two extra strength left over, and with that, they're going to grab two pieces of wood. The wood's going to go down here into their warehouse, and then this animal they just killed is going to go right up here. Now what happens is they're going to generate meat for this killed animal, and you're going to get meat equal to the number on the top, equal to the number of that type of animal that they've already killed. Now there are level 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 animals, so this is the easiest one to kill, and this is the first of the threes that they've killed, so that means they're going to get one meat. Now that would normally be what happens, but if you look down here, they started off the game filling up this building, which means they're going to get plus two meat when they do a hunting action, so instead of getting one, they're going to grab three. 
So those go up here into their storage, and as you'll notice, this die has a three on it, which shows that they only need to spend three supplies at the end of the round currently, and so they've done that with their first action. Now, as I mentioned before, you can only use each room once, so if the blue player was to go hunting again, they would not get this plus two meat bonus again in this given round. Next up is the white player's turn to move, and they've decided to grab this three right here, and they're going to move over to the forest. Now, you'll notice that there is an active five in that area, and this is an active three, and you only need to worry about a higher strength value opponent when they move into the zone. So you can come in after, and there's no uh, penalties that happen. This is a uh, three activation, and they're just going to come over here and grab all three of this wood. With that done, it's now back to us for movement, and let's go ahead and continue with the plan we talked about earlier. We'll take our five, and now we'll move over here into the Silent Peak, because we vacated it on the previous turn. Once here, we can now see that we're not going to be applying any pressure, because there are no other lower value active heroes. So now we can spend our strength on one of two different things. The first is we can pick up new broken equipment. Now, it costs one uh, strength point to take any of these. And as you can see, this one, if repaired, would allow us to pick up two metal every time we visited the cargo ship location, which is pretty good. This one right here, if repaired, would allow us to grab two microchips every time we went to the military base where we'd also get um, our ammunition. So that's pretty great. And lastly, this baseball bat would just apply uh, one more pressure once per round, which is also quite good. But the main reason we're coming here is to scavenge the city itself. And as you can see right here, it is a three-player game, so there's going to be eight tiles in the stack of ten. We've discarded these two at the start, so we know what is not going to be in here and what we potentially uh, will not be able to scavenge. And I think let's go ahead and start. We don't need to specify how much strength we're going to do back and forth. So let's pick a few of these and maybe decide to grab one of these once we see what kind of stuff we scavenge. So the first thing we're going to grab is going to be a uh, scrap metal. So we'll put this right here and we'll take one metal from the supply. Let's go ahead and do that again. We'll flip this over right here and it is a survival uh, ration. So that is going to be one can of uh, food and this one survives from round to round, which is much better than the meat, which spoils from round to round if you don't spend it. At this point, we have three more strength to spend, and there are six more tiles in the stack. And two of those tiles are empty cupboards, which normally would mean we'd get nothing. But considering we uh, spent at the start of our, uh, our setup uh, manning a room, which would get us a bunch of stuff in empty cupboards, we really want to try and find those. So we're kind of mining down to see if we can get one, and here it is. All right, so we got an empty cupboard. And as you can see over here on the room, that's going to actually get us a wood and a metal, which is a lot better than nothing. But of course, we can only do this once per city, so if we pull the other cupboard, we will indeed get nothing. Okay, so we've used three out of our five strength, and I figure let's now grab this hacksaw, because we know that we have at least uh, one wood, one metal, and one microchip, so hopefully at the end of the round, we can go ahead and repair this so that we can gather some metal every time we go to the cargo ship, which is a really nice ability. So this goes in front of us, and we have one more strength left, and we could grab one of these two here, or we could push our luck a little bit more. There are, let's see, I guess five more of these, and one is an empty cupboard, but I figure let's give it a shot. So we use our last strength, and we'll flip this over, and it says algae pills. Oh, wow, this is actually going to reduce our, our uh, radioactivity by one more, so we actually got to do that twice in this round. As you can see, that brings us to this plus three point spot, and we're actually pegged out, so we don't want to probably search the other city, because if we find another one of those algae pills, it's essentially like nothing, because we are bottomed out. Well, with our movement done, Blue now gets to go, and they've decided to grab this three right here, and they're going to move up to the military depot, and they're just going to grab three ammunition. Next up, the white player gets to go, and they're going to move this hero over here to the Blackwood city. Once they arrive, they now have three strength actions to use, and they're going to start things off by going from the top of this Blackwood stack. The first thing is going to be some munitions. They're going to use their second strength point to take another one, and this one's going to be Holy Water. And now with their third one, they've decided to grab this exoskeleton right here. It's going to take a wood microchip and a metal to get built, but then once per uh, round, they could use this to move any of their heroes as far as they want to, as opposed to being limited by two. All of these now come over into their shelter, and now we get to move one of our heroes. At this point, we only have our two level three strength heroes left, and we know we need to get water on our turn because we currently have zero water, and this little die right here shows that the person in the airlock requires a water. And if we don't give it to them, then they're going to die off, which is certainly not something we want to see. So now let's go ahead and I think move up into the dam. And as you can see, it's a little bit special because when you go to this area, you have to spend a microchip in order to unlock the door to the filtration system because the water is radioactive. Uh, now you only need to spend one microchip for the entire action. And when we look out to these two options, we can see that this one can get over here and this one can't. 
Now, there are a couple things to consider here, actually. When we look at what all of our opponents have done, well, if we were to move over there, we'd be a level 3, but it looks like none of our opponents could move in after us and exert pressure on our weaker um, uh, hero here. But the other thing that we'd really like to do is come down here to the cargo ship. Now, when we come over here, there is a specific slot for each type of hero, and that means that, uh, as we can see over here, if one of our opponents gets in to the 3 slot before we do, then we'd actually be locked out. But right now, the blue player is the only one that could do that, and they have to move their four out before this three can come over here. And the uh, yellow player, oh yeah, the yellow player has a five, so that's not going to compete there. But if we moved over here as the three, and then the five came in after that, they would exert two pressure on us because it would be five minus three. And we certainly don't want to be put in that situation. So let's go ahead and do the dam plan. <laughs> Sorry, the, the plan going to the dam, that is. We will pick this one up and go over here. We'll then spend one of our three microchips, and we're going to grab three water. Next up, it's the blue player's turn, and they're going to move this hero over to the Blackwood City. They now have three strength actions to evaluate, and the first one they're going to do is from the top here, and that's going to get them a wood. And with their second and third actions, they're actually going to pick up both of these pieces of equipment because they work really well together. This jerry can means when they go to the dam, they pick up an extra water. And this access card means when they go to the dam, they get free access and they don't have to spend the microchip. Obviously, these get used once per round and it's quite a bit of resources to get them built out. But the uh, blue player likes the idea of trying to get this synergy going. Also, uh, one thing to note is this little uh, blue symbol right here. Once you uh, repair your equipment and you can kind of match up these symbols like this, then that is worth a bonus point at the end of the game just for uh, synergistic effects right? like this one. So that wood goes into their cache, and now they get these two parts down here, and the white player can go. They've decided to grab their strength four hero and move over here to the silent peak. That's going to give them four strength actions, and they're going to start off by scavenging from the top. It looks like the first one they hit is the empty cupboard. That's going to get them nothing, unfortunately, but now they know that the rest of these are going to be actual things. So their second action is going to be this, getting them ammunitions. Uh, now they have two more actions, and there are two pieces of equipment over here. And I don't think they want to do both of these. So they're going to take one more from the top to see if it sways them. This is going to be, uh, ooh, household appliances. That's going to get them a microchip. And now they can pick between these two, and they've decided to grab this baseball bat. Uh, they already have the three wood available if they wanted to actually get this repaired this turn. And then they could use this once per turn to add one to pressure applied. And we haven't seen any um, pressure happen in this round uh, just yet. But when you pressure an opponent, you can either make them uh, spend money or actually take some of their supplies. So pressure is certainly a good thing to have on your side. So these all go over into the white player's shelter, and now we can make our last movement for the round. This level 3 down here is the one that we have to move, and when we look at our various options, well, we can see that uh, Blackwood City is pretty depleted. There's nothing up here really in the forest that we'd be able to do. Uh, we could go over here to the ca ca cargo ship, which looks really good for us, or we could come over here to the mine and pick up three of these uh, pieces of metal. Now, it seems obvious, right? Let's totally go to the cargo ship. We'd plant right here. We'd get a can of food and an extra survivor, which is good. But the thing is, we know that the white player is going to move their five over here onto the cargo ship on their next turn because they started the game with a room that gives them a bonus when they go onto the spot. So if they did that, then they would be applying five pressure onto our three. That would be a difference of two. And we do have three ammunition. So if we went over here, we could just spend those two ammunition to not give the white player anything or we could just come over here and grab some metal. I think at the end of the day, this is probably going to be worth it to us, especially considering the first player to come over here to the cargo ship gets to grab this first player token. So by going over here, we had this already, and we're going to keep it for the next round, which is certainly nice. Although in situations like this, I guess the white player is kind of happy that they get to act after us. So, all right, we'll go onto this spot. That's going to generate one canned food for us, and then we take this survivor right here. And we can put them down into any open room in our uh, subterranean area. Now, this is the only way that you can actually bring a survivor in immediately and not have them get uh, stuck into the airlock. And you'll see what I mean by that pretty soon here once we get to the night phase. But right now, we don't actually have any open slots in any of our rooms because none of these are built out. So we're going to put this down into the airlock anyway. And considering there was an extra slot there, it's not even going to increase the amount of water that we would need. So I think that is a pretty good turn for us. At this point, Blue's final hero is this four over here on the cargo ship. They're going to move this over to the fairgrounds, and once they get here, they're going to spend three out of their four to kill off this animal, and then with their fourth one, they're going to grab a microchip. 
These are now going to come back into their shelter, and as you can see, they now have killed off two of these, uh, this type of animal right here. So that means they're going to get two meat instead of the one. Now, I mentioned before that they don't get the use of this one until the following round of the game, so they're just going to get two meat, which brings them up to five, which is pretty good when you consider that they're actually going to be losing a survivor at the later stages of the round. The blue player was not able to get the one water that was required to kind of maintain this, uh, uh, the survivor over there, so uh, by getting a lot of this meat, they can actually spend the meat to get new survivors, and I'll explain how that works once we get into the night phase, which is going to be pretty soon, but uh, before we do that, the white player gets to do their final move. In this case, it's no surprise to us they're going to grab their five and plant it down right here. So they are now exerting two pressure on us because that is the difference between this. And if we did nothing about this, then we would be forced to take two of our supplies or our materials and give them over to the white player. But instead, we have three ammunition, so we can go ahead and spend two of it right now to equate the difference. This does not go to the white player. This goes into the supply, which is good. We're not giving something to our opponent. And now the uh, pressure phase is over, and the white player can just evaluate their turn. You can see right here, this is going to get them three canned food, as well as this survivor right here. These all go down into their shelter, and since this is the first survivor into the airlock, that's actually going to increase their water need to one, but fortunately they do have a water here already. And as I mentioned, they have this uh, one room built out, which gives them one uh, plus one canned goods when they go to the cargo ship, so they're actually going to get a fourth canned good for doing that. At this point, all of the heroes have now stood up and moved around the board, so with this we can now move into the night phase. Now there are seven different steps to the night phase, and the first of these involves all of us trying to overcome the event. Currently there is only one face-up event, and we get to go first. Now if we were to spend three water, which we do have, then we would overcome this event and we would get rid of it, and we would get three points at the end of the game, which is certainly pretty good for us. Now the problem is that we have exactly three water, and if we spent it, then one of our survivors would die off, and I don't particularly care about there being less wood in the supply right now, so we're going to go ahead and pass on this, and so will both of our opponents, because they don't even have enough water to make it viable. Next up in the night phase, we have the feed survivors mode. We're going to lose one survivor for every missing supply that we have, and as we can see right here, we have one water required because we have uh, just this one top level of our airlock, and then over here we only have one of these rooms built out. It has a requirement of two, so we can go ahead and do this by spending this one water right here, and then we can spend both of these canned foods to make sure that everybody's fed and nobody's dying off. Unfortunately, the same thing cannot be said for our blue player over here. Now, they do have the three uh, meat up here to meet this supply, but over here they do not have any water because of this uh, one right down here. They never picked any up, so they do have to lose a survivor. I'm pretty sure it does not have to be this one. It could be any of their survivors, but in this case, this survivor is going to be the one to get removed. And this is important because every survivor is worth one point at the end of the game, and this one is now gone. Lastly, the white player easily feeds all of their people. And now each player has to manage their radioactivity. So the way we do this is we look to the number of survivors in the airlock, and in the first round there is only one radioactivity coming through, and each survivor blocks out one. So we have two survivors, so we're certainly fine. That means our radioactivity is not going to go down. Unfortunately for the blue player, they have now killed off their one person from the airlock, so that one ra radioactivity escapes into their shelter, and this token is now going to move down, which is into the minus one point, which is minus one point to the end of the game. So I suppose by killing this person off, they've now effectively lost two points, but they're going to stick by their decision there. And lastly, over here, the white player has one person in the airlock, so they are fine, and uh, this is just the first round. In the second round, it's going to be um, two radioactivity that we're going to be fighting against, and it's going to scale all the way up to three once we get into the later rounds of the game. Next up, we have the fourth phase of the night, and in this one, we can spend our supplies in order to recruit new survivors. Now, supplies are just uh, food, meat, and uh, canned supplies, and I figure, let's go ahead and do it. We'll spend both of our water, and we will pull two new survivors out of the wilderness, I suppose. They have to go over into the airlock in this case. Uh, even if there were some empty slots, you would have to put them into the airlock. By putting these two in, we've now gone into the second row, which means our water requirement has now increased up to two, and that's definitely something we want to keep in mind in the next round. Now this phase can happen simultaneously, and both of our opponents are going to do this as well. The blue player is going to spend both of their meat, and they're going to do this for a couple reasons. And the biggest one is that meat is going to spoil between rounds, and they would lose it anyway. So they're going to spend both of these, and that will get them two survivors from the supply. Those have to go down into the airlock, and we can see they're now back to needing one water. And the white player over here, they're going to decide to spend all three of these canned goods. Even though they could keep these, they're going to play things a little bit uh, fast and loose and try and get a lot of survivors over here. So with three canned goods gone, 
They're going to add three more survivors into that area, and now they too are going to have a water upkeep of two. Next up, we have phase five, and in this one, we can build new rooms into our area. Now, as you can see, every single room costs three building materials, which are wood, metal, or microchips. Now, I think what we should do is build this one right here because it's going to allow us to repair one piece of equipment for free um, each round. And we actually repair equipment after this round, so that would be this uh, round as well as the rest of them in the game, as long, of course, as we keep it manned up with survivors. So we're going to flip this one over like that, and I figure let's go ahead and spend a couple metal as well as maybe one of these microchips. And now is the phase where we can take survivors out of the airlock and move them into various other rooms. As I mentioned before, you can never move survivors out of previously placed rooms, but I think let's go ahead and get this going. We will pull all three of these out right here, and now we have this online so that we can build either this backpack or this hacksaw when we get to phase six. But before we do that, let's go ahead and see what our opponents are going to build. Blue is going to spend one metal as well as two wood, and they're going to get this room going, which says one permanent water. They certainly are wishing they had this on the last round, and this essentially just gives them a water that they can use every single round of the game. Now, of course, it needs to be fully manned up, and for now, they only have two survivors. They are going to bring them over like that, and that's going to increase this to a five requirement in their area. But if they're able to maybe go to the uh, cargo ship and place one person down in here, then this will activate, and they will have use of it on their turn. Oops, let's come back over here real quick and see our extra upkeep. When we built this right here, it added three. So now we are also going to need to do five on the next turn. All right, let's see what white builds. They've decided to spend three of their microchips, and they're going to get this room construction done. So this gets flipped over, and now this is a once-per-round use, which they could actually use this round if they wanted to, as long, of course, as it gets filled up with survivors from their airlock. And that means they can construct another room for just one material, but they've decided they're actually going to save uh, this three wood for now. That is going to add two to their overall uh, supply needs for the next round. And with that, we can now move on to the next phase. In this case, it's going to be repairing equipment. When we come back over to us, we see that we don't have that many resources left, but we do have the ability to repair one equipment for free each round. So now we get to decide which one of these it's going to be. Well, this uh, backpack will allow us to get two more microchips every time we go to the fairgrounds, which is where we get microchips anyway. So we essentially could double down and just have lots of microchips. This other one is the hacksaw, and it says that whenever we go to the cargo ship, which is where we can get canned goods as well as new survivors, we'll also get two metal. And I think I like the variety of this one, like it diversifies our various things like gain a survivor as well as get metal. This might mean we just don't ever go to the mine spot and that's probably a good thing to kind of reduce the options that we want to do so that we can uh, really focus on the actions that are good for us. So yeah, let's go ahead and get this hacksaw built. Next up we have the blue player and they want to get this access card done. So that's going to spend, uh, cost them one microchip, one wood, and one metal. And now once per round when they go to the dam, they get free access and they don't have to spend any microchips for it. Lastly, we have the white player and they're going to spend all three of these wood to get this baseball bat going, which none of the rest of us are happy about. So that means once per round, they're going to have the ability to add one to the pressure that they are applying. So that means they're probably going to be forcing us to spend more uh, munitions or just taking some of our supplies, which is only good for them. Okay, we finally reached night phase seven, which is the final one. And in this one, we just have to do the upkeep on our various stores. We have to discard down to two water. We have to get rid of all of our meat. We can save as much canned goods as well as all of these supplies as we want to. And as you can see, no one actually has to lose any supplies. So with that, the night phase is over and now we can move into the dawn phase of the next round. This is essentially a board reset. We're going to lay all of the various survivors down in the spots on the board, and then we're going to replenish every one of the spots on the board up to their cap. So that means that uh, places like this are going to go up to eight microchips. We're going to reset all of these uh, scavenge stacks in the cities so that there are just two random ones that are out of the pile. Also, we're going to discard all of the pieces of equipment that were remaining, and we're going to pull three more out for each city. Now that the dawn phase is over, we can move into the day phase, and we're going to start by revealing an event. Although before I flip this over, I would like to point out these little numbers along the top are the amount of radiation that's going to affect us at the end of the round. So it will be two on this round, and as you can see, it'll be two for the next couple rounds, and then three near the end of the game. So let's go ahead and flip this over, and it looks like we have to deal with some nomads. The text here says that we're going to decrease the search tile availability for each city by three because it's a three-player game. And of course, this wildfire is still raging, which means we're going to have three less wood in the forest. In this case, the forest now goes down to five wood instead of eight. 
And now we have to pull three more tiles off of the, both of these stacks, and these will be unavailable. Looks like both of the munitions and a scrap metal over here in the Blackwood are not going to be there. And then over here in the Silent Peak, the uh, canned food, scrap metal, and munitions as well. So we didn't hit any of the empty cupboards, which is kind of good for us because it makes it more likely that we will hit the empty cupboards. But uh, either way, that is what the nomads do. Oh, what am I talking about? There's an empty cupboard over here. Well, either way, there's still one over here and two in there. So if we search a city, we're most likely to try and make it this one. Although, unfortunately, this is the one that we're already in. But either way, let's now move into the movement phase. And since we are still the starting player, we get to go first. Well, first things first, let's now consider what we want to do in this round, and especially consider the scarcities. There are a lot less wood over here, as well as in the two cities. And in particular, we would really like to hit this city up for a nice big activation. Now, in order to do that, we have to pull our five out so that we can maybe move the four into there and get to a whole bunch of these different things. And in order to move the five out, we kind of want to think about where that's going to go. Now, we do have this backpack, and it costs three wood to get made. We have the ability to make uh, one, uh, to repair one piece of equipment for free each round, but we can repair multiple pieces of equipment each round. So one possibility is we can move the three over to the forest. We could grab three wood right there, and that would be enough to get this backpack made in addition to maybe one of these pieces of equipment that we could pick up by moving the four over to this area. Again, of course, if we're uh, as long as we get there before one of our opponents do. But another thing we have to keep in mind is we don't want to fall into the trap that the blue player did last turn of not having any water. Right now we have zero water and we have a at least one re water requirement. So when we consider that one of these four really should end up at the dam, I think we're kind of in a bind. <laughs> I mean, I would love to get down to this um, uh, cargo ship because we got this hacksaw going, and when we go there, we're going to get two extra wood, but I don't think we can do everything that we want to do on this turn, which means something is probably going to have to give. Uh, unfortunately, I think it might be going to the city because if we want to consider that this three just cannot make it all the way up to the dam, the dam is too far away, and we definitely have to vacate the spot. I guess we could go to the city with this one right here, but then the, our ordering is off because we want this to go over here and we can't do that before this one's gone. So man, this is definitely a bit of a bind for us. Well, after thinking about it a little bit more, let's go ahead and move this one first and we'll go to this city. Uh, it's definitely not as good as that one because one of the two empty cupboards has popped out already, but it is something that's going to allow us to get this away and we might hit the other empty cupboard, which certainly could be good for us. So we're going to travel over here. We can see that this is our three strength hero and these uh, uh, equipments over here are relatively interesting, in particular this chainsaw. Whenever we go to a city, well, once per round, we could grab two wood. That's certainly a nice uh, synergy with the fact that we want to go to cities anyway. This thermal sensor, when going hunting, we could hunt anything from the stack, not just the top one, which is also pretty nice. And then this crowbar lets you get two uh, microchips whenever you go to the military base. I think that with our three strength action, we're certainly not going to want to take more than one of these. I don't think. So let's go ahead and start by uh, digging from the top and seeing what we get. The first thing, oh no, it's um, uh, an algae pills. This is not going to help us out at all because we maxed out on our track. So that's essentially a whiff for us. Well, we still have two more strength actions to do. So let's draw the top thing here. And it is the empty covered. Great. Okay, so that means we get to activate our ability which gives us a wood and a uh, metal, and I realized that I think I explained this one wrong last round. You can do this once per city, so if we end up going over to the Silent Peak, we could actually activate this one again if we hit one of those cupboards. So that's definitely a pretty good situation for us. Well, with only one strength action left and the fact that we've already seen both of these empty cupboards, let's go ahead and grab one of these pieces of equipment. Oopsie daisy. And it'll be this chainsaw. It just synergizes too well with where we want to go anyway. And it looks like it's going to take a couple microchips and a metal. So maybe this is going to be the one that we do for free. Well, we'll figure that out later. But either way, it's now the blue player's turn to move. Oops, I just realized this algae over here in the military base does need to get flipped over so that somebody else can potentially activate that on their turn. We certainly don't want to do that since we are pegged out there. After thinking about it for a bit, the blue player wants to activate their level 4 uh, hero, and they're going to go right over here to the cargo ship. That goes into the 4 spot, which means that no other 4s can go over here. They're going to grab the survivor as well as two cans of food. As I mentioned before, this is the only time where when you get a survivor, you can bring them directly into your shelter and not have them necessarily stop at the airlock. And the blue player is going to do that. They're going to put this down here into their uh, room right here, which is going to give them one permanent water that they now have access to. It's now time for White to take their first action, and they've decided to take this four right here, and they're going to go down to the mine. Now, once here, they're going to do a little bit of uh, mining as well as hunting. As you can see, this animal takes five strength, and they only have a four, but you are allowed to spend some of your munitions in order to reduce the uh, strength of the animal that you're trying to kill. 
So in this case, the uh, white player has decided they're going to use two of these munitions. That will bring this down to a three, which means they actually have one extra strength. So that they'll be able to take this right here, and they'll get to grab one mine, uh, one uh, metal with that extra strength they have because they spent all this munitions. As we can see, this is the first level five animal that they killed, so they're going to get three meat from the supply. Okay, so it's now come back to us, and I figure let's go ahead and head over to the cargo ship. We know we want to do this anyway, so we'll move this five going one, two, and there are a couple of good things going on. The first is when we land here, we actually have a five, and there is an activated four here, so we're going to put pressure on the blue player, and that pressure is the difference, which is going to be one. In this case, the blue player can either give us one of their supplies or materials, or they can shoot off one munition shell to make up for the difference, and that's what they're going to do. So this is now gone, and we can now go for our activation. We're going to grab the survivor as well as three uh, cans of food. The survivor could go into any of our open rooms, but right now all we have is the airlock. So we'll slide this right over there, and now the blue player can move. They've decided they want to move their five strength hero, and they're going to go down two spaces over here to the uh, carnival. Once they land here, this is five on the strength, and the animal requires four to kill, so they will kill this one off, and they have one strength left over, so they will decide to grab one microchip while they're there. As we can see, this is the first of the four level animals that they killed off, so they're going to get two meat, but then this room is going to give them plus two meat. They get to activate this once per round, so that means they're going to get four total here into their supplies, and they now have quite a bit of food available to themselves. Next up, it's the white player's turn to go, and they're going to head over here to the Silent Peak. Once here, they have five different strength actions to evaluate, so they're going to start by drawing from the top. They're going to get one munition. Next up, they're going to get a algae reduction on their area. Uh, they have three more to do, and it looks like there are still none of the empty cupboards, and there are just three of these left. So it's very likely um, that the next one they pull is going to be the empty cupboards. But with these three, well, the first one they want to do is, uh, of those three, I guess the third action total, is going to be to grab this grappling hook. So after they've done that, they have two more strength actions left over. Now, they could take this purifier here just to have a lot of different resources in front of themselves, but they figure with two things left over, they will push their luck a little bit, flip this over, yeah, it's an empty cupboard. So that means they have one last action, and it's going to be a 50-50 shot over here on the search pile or grabbing one of these, and they figure they'll take the thing that's guaranteed. This is rather nice. Whenever they go to the mine, they could take a water so they wouldn't have to go to the dam and pay a, a chip in order to make that happen. So they're going to take this one and they're going to add that into their shelter along with that munitions they found and the one tick up on their radiation track. Okay, it's once again our turn, and I just realized I forgot to use this hacksaw last turn when we went to the cargo ship. I absolutely would have done that, so let's go ahead and evaluate that. We're going to tip this over to show that we've used it this turn, and now we do get to grab two metal and put those into our supply, and now let's figure out where we're going to move. At the moment, we just have our two heroes left up here, and we know that we need to send this four over here to the dam in order to get some water because we currently don't have any. So that means, realistically, we have to move this strength three one. And when we look around at our options, we could go over here to the forest where nobody's gone there yet, actually. We could pick up three different woods. We could also head down here to the Silent Peak, and that is actually the only thing we could do because the other two spots are blocked off by our heroes. So if we were to go over here, we get three wood. But by process of elimination down here, we can tell that one of these is going to be another open uh, empty cupboard, and the other one is going to be a wooden plank. That means if we went down here, we would be activating the other city so we could use our uh, bonus room one more time. That room gets us a wood and a metal, and then the other thing we get is a plank for two strength actions, and then we could pick up an exoskeleton part as well. So I think that is definitely a better plan for us. So we'll activate this guy. We'll go over here. And we'll spend those first two actions revealing what we know to be true. So there is the plank and the empty cupboard. And with our third strength bonus, we'll grab this exoskeleton. This is our third piece of broken equipment. And we're also going to get the two wood and metal because of that bonus. And we have quite a bit of resources available to ourselves. So hopefully we can get a few of these pieces of equipment made. Uh, especially when you consider that when you build these rooms and populate them, you get a higher and higher cost to actually feed everybody. But when you build these equipment, it makes your actions more efficient and there is no extra cost through needing to feed extra people. So I think equipment is definitely a good thing for us to be focusing on. It's now time for Blue to move one of their heroes and they're going to take this three and they're going to head over to the forest. Once they're there, they certainly can't find a level seven uh, animal. So they're just going to take three wood into their shelter. Next up, we have the white player and they're going to activate their three strength uh, hero and they're going to head down to the cargo ship. And once they get here, they'll get to take one survivor as well as one can of food. And that survivor has to go into the airlock because there are no other open spots for them. 
All right, it's now time for our last movement, and we don't really need to think about this. We know we need water, so we're going to head over to the dam. We're going to spend our single microchip to activate the purification system, and then we're going to grab for water. Next up, we have the blue player, and despite the fact that they have this access card that they built last turn, they have rethought uh, things, and they're not going to be using it, and they're going to head down to the mine. Once here, they're simply going to grab three pieces of metal, so they're probably kicking themselves a little bit when they could have potentially gotten this pickaxe done last turn to pick up even more metal instead of building this access card, but ah, these are the decisions that they made, so they have to live with it. We've now reached the last move of the round, and the white player is going to move over here. Uh, they really want water, but they realize they don't actually have any microchips, so they don't have the ability to open up the filtration system. So that means one of their survivors is probably going to die, but that's going to happen later on. For now, they're just going to head down over here to Blackwood, and once they land, they are going to wield this um, baseball bat, which is going to increase the pressure applied by one. In this case, that means the pressure is 4 to R3, so we do have to deal with that one pressure, so we're going to either give them one supply or uh, material, or we can go ahead and shoot off our last piece of ammunition, and I think let's go ahead and do that to make up the difference. At this point, the white player feels pretty good about this area because both of the empty cupboards have been uh, opened up already, so there are three tiles left, and they're just going to activate all of them. This first one is going to get them a wood, this second one is going to get them a microchip, and this last one is going to get them a canned food. All right, at this point, all of the hero movements are done, and we can now shift into the night phase. Before we move on, I just realized that the blue player visited the cargo ship first, so they should have taken this first player token, and they are now going to get to start everything off with the night phase. The first thing that we need to try to do is overcome events, and it starts with the blue player, and even though they do have three meat, they decide they don't want to try and fix this nomad situation. Uh, it then goes over to the white player, and they don't want to do either of these, and with us, we actually have four water available to ourselves, but if we spent all four water to, cure, uh, to fix this wildfire right here, we would not quite have enough um, supplies to feed all of our survivors, in which case we would lose survivors, and that's bad. So I think let's just let the wildfire rage on a little bit longer. <laughs> these things are just going to start stacking up. I mean, these are pretty good amount of victory points you can get for overcoming these. I just think uh, maybe all of our engines need to be a little bit better before that happens. So we're all going to pass on overcoming. Next up, everybody needs to feed their survivors, and we can start over here with us. We need to spend one water for our airlock situation, and then over here we need to spend five more supplies, so that'll be all three of these canned goods, and then two of our water, so we just have one water remaining. Next up, we have the blue player over here. We can see that they have no water needs at all because there's nobody in their airlock, which is not going to be good for them come the next phase. But either way, they can then try to feed their other people, and this room down here creates a permanent one water per turn. So they're going to use that for one of the five that they need to consume, and then they'll use all four of their meat to take care of the other uh, four. Lastly, we now have the white player, and this is the turn for them to kind of have water problems. There is zero water here, and they do have people in their airlock. They need to spend one water, and they don't have it, so one of their survivors is going to die. And they've decided it's going to be one of the people from this room. They're going to try to fill it back in with some of the other resources later on in this night phase. So this person is gone, but they still have to pay three different other supplies for the main rooms. And for that, they will use all three of their meat. Okay, moving on, we now have the third phase in which we have to manage our radioactivity. We have two survivors in our airlock, and there is two radio radioactivity coming in, so that means nothing happens, and we're going to stay pegged out there. Uh, next, we have the blue player, and they have zero people in their airlock, so they're going to lose two radioactivity, bringing them down to minus three on this track, which is really not great. Maybe they should have killed somebody else off on their last turn, but either way, they're just going to have to deal with this. And now we have the white player over here, who does still have two people in their airlock, so their token is not going to move. Next up, let's move into phase four where people can recruit new survivors, and the blue player is going to spend two supplies in order to bring in two new survivors into their base, and those go into their airlock, which means they now have a water requirement of one. The white player is going to spend one of their canned goods in order to recruit one survivor. And now that it's come back to us, I figure let's do the same. We're going to use this last water and bring in the survivor. And the reason we're going to do that is so that we can try to build one of these rooms out and then bring all three survivors into it to man that room so that we can use it. Now, this does mean that we are likely to have zero or one survivors in our airlock next round when the radioactivity happens. But honestly, we could kind of use having this token go down a little bit so that we can have it go back up again when we happen to bump into those uh, algae pills when we are going through the different cities, which is something that we are going to continue to do. 
We've now reached phase five where players can build new rooms. We start with the blue player, but they've decided they're going to save their resources for uh, their equipment and they're not going to build any rooms. Next up, we have the white player, and they're going to use one of each of these building materials, essentially caching them out, in order to build this uh, room right here. Now, this is kind of a special one. It says, add one survivor to this room, uh, up to a maximum of eight. And this is the only room where you can have more survivors than the actual ones printed on here. So this is going to get flipped over, and they're then going to take all three of these and fill in these slots so that this can be activated. This is also going to increase their uh, needs by two, going up to five on the supply stack there. And essentially, if you remember, each one of these survivors is worth one point at the end of the game. So this room exists just to gather more and more survivors so that they get more points. This room does get activated during phase five of the night, and you can activate these as soon as they exist. So they're going to go ahead and do that and put this down right there. And as you can see, this doesn't actually increase their needs of the overall colony. It just gives them uh, points that they don't really have to pay for, I guess, beyond the uh, two food that they're going to have to do each turn there. Next up, it's our turn, and I think we should go ahead and spend three of this metal right here in order to get this room built. It says that you can draw one equipment tile and then repair one piece of equipment for minus one material. And this kind of synergizes up with this one getting us a free equipment. This just means that we can have lots of equipment being made and equipment is definitely good. So we're gonna put this down right here and this is gonna increase our needs by two. This brings us up precariously to seven supply. I'm not sure if this is a bad idea or not. That's a lot of food that we have to feed on the next round, but we'll, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, of course, that actually happens when we put people into it, but we're of course gonna do that. So all these people go down like that. At this point, I think it is worth mentioning that at the end of the game, we're gonna get a decent amount of points based off of the number of completed rooms, which means built and completely full of survivors at the end of the game. So having more rooms is certainly a good thing. As you can see, you can get all the way up to 17 points total if you have all of them manned, but wow, that would be a lot of supply we'd have to feed every single turn. Next up, we have phase six, which is repairing equipment. So for this, the blue player has decided to get both this pickaxe and this uh, jerry can going. That's going to cost them a total of three metal and three wood, and they just happen to have that. Next up, we have the white player, and they actually should have a couple resources. I just realized that last round when they built this building, they should have definitely used this room right here, which lets them build a building at minus two resources. So let's go ahead and put this wood and microchip back, although that's still not quite enough for the white player to get any of this equipment built, so they'll just hold on to those for the next round. Lastly, it is our turn, and we have a couple cool things to do. The first is we should activate this room, which lets us draw the random top piece of equipment, and it looks like it is an ammo box. So this says when we go to the military base, we can pull two more uh, ammo, so that's pretty good. And now we have the ability to build one of these or repair one of these at minus one cost, and then another one we can just make for free. Now, I think we definitely want to make sure this chainsaw happens, and we obviously have no microchips, so this is certainly one that we should do for free, so that kind of exhausts that room right there. Next up, we have the ability to make one of these at minus one resource, and I wonder what the right call is. Like, we could do this one naturally with the three wood. Uh, we could also do this exoskeleton, I suppose, if we deduct the cost of this one microchip for this, then we could spend our one metal and a wood to make that happen, and then we can actually make this one naturally by spending all three of these wood. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. That's three pieces of equipment. Uh, you don't, uh, you get one uh, victory point, sorry, at the end of the game for every one of these equipment that you make, and then of course there are bonuses if you can match up these symbols. So this is certainly a pretty good thing for us, we have lots of options of cool stuff to do on the next round. We've now reached night phase seven, and this is simple. We just um, do some upkeep on our shelters. Uh, everybody loses all of their meat, and we all have to make sure that we are not storing more than two water. That is the case for everybody. In fact, we're somewhat tapped out on most of these resources. So we can now move into the third day of the game with the dawn phase. Now that everything is set up on the board, we can move into the day phase, and we'll start off with an event. So it looks like we have Thieves. This says that we're going to decrease the fairgrounds reserve of microchips by three. Uh, in order to overcome this one, it's going to cost three ammunition as well as two microchips. And when we add that in with the uh, minus three on each of our city stacks on the search piles, as well as the minus three wood, that is quite a bit of scarcity starting to pile up on us. Before we move on, we do have to evaluate those uh, events. So the Thieves steal some microchips. The fire continues to burn in the forest. And now the Nomads are going to discard three things from each of these stacks. It looks like over here in Blackwood, there's a scrap metal, an empty cupboard, and a munitions that are no longer available. And over here at the Silent Peak, it's going to be uh, microchips, 
wood and an empty cupboard. Uh, we're not we're too happy to see an empty cupboard show up in both of those spots, but oh well. Oops, I just realized during the dawn phase we do have to reset our equipment, so we'll discard these and we'll pull three new ones out for each of the cities. At this point, it's now time to do movement, and the blue player gets to go first. Now, they've decided to begin with this four, and they're going to head over to the Blackwood. Once here, they have four strength actions to evaluate, and it looks like there are five tiles in this stack still. They're going to start by using one to draw this, and it looks like they got an algae pills, which is definitely something they were hoping to find. Uh, they have been having some radiation issues. Uh, for their second one, they're going to grab again. It looks like they get an empty cover. That's definitely uh, not as good as they were hoping for. Uh, the third one will be flipping this over, and it gets them a water. And with their last strength action, they're going to grab this bear trap right here. When they come back to their shelter, that algae brings them back to minus two. So <laughs> still not great, but it's better than it was. Next up, we have the white player, and they've decided to activate this hero and move over to the parade grounds. Now, this is a strength three hero, and once they go here, they're going to shoot off one of their two ammunition to lower the strength value of this uh, three level animal. So that makes it a two, which leaves them with one strength left, and with it, they're going to grab a uh, computer chip. As we can see over here, they have not killed a level three animal before, so that is just going to get them one meat, unfortunately. Okay, it's now time for us to make our first movement, and there are a few things we need to think about. Uh, there are a couple things we want to make happen. Uh, one is heading over to the fairground so that we can utilize this backpack and pick up some more microchips. We also know we want to go to a city and get some extra wood when we visit there. Also, we uh, do really good when we go to cities and we get those empty cupboards. Uh, we also have this hacksaw, which is going to get us uh, two metal when we head over to the cargo ship. So if we're going to try and do all three of those things, then we have to kind of uh, uh, jigger some of these things around because the uh, last thing is potentially going over to get some water. But either way, um, none of those things gives us a ton of supplies, and we have seven supplies that we need to deal with. Now, we need zero water right now because there's nobody in our airlock, so I guess that is a slight consolation prize. And I think the way we should start things off is uh, taking our level five person and move them over here to the fairgrounds. When we look a little bit closer, there are lots of reasons to do this. The first is that we're putting quite a bit of pressure here onto the uh, white player who is maybe regretting their first turn there. In fact, that is two pressure in this case. Now, they decide to uh, fire off one of their ammunition, but they have no more ammunition. And there's still one pressure uh, being applied here, so they have to give us one of their supplies. Now, uh, currently, they have a meat, a canned food. Uh, they also have a wood and two microchips. And they decide the thing they want to give us to nullify that last point of pressure is one microchip. So that's really nice for us. And now, once we're here, we have five strength points to use. So let's use uh, one of them to grab one of these microchips, and that is all the requirement we need to activate this backpack. Now, you don't just get these two for visiting the fairgrounds. You have to use at least one point in gathering microchips, and this allows us to gather more. So we'll take this and then two more for the backpack usage, and then we still have four more strength left, which works out really well because there is a level four strength animal right here. So we can take this one off, and that is going to be the first thing that we've killed in this game. So we're going to grab two meat for that. So that was a really good turn for us. It's now time for Blue to move their second hero, and they're going to head over here to the dam. Once they get here, they're going to use both of these uh, pieces of equipment they have in front of themselves. This access card means they don't have to spend the microchip to unlock the use of the water filtration system. And this jerry can means that when they harvest at least one, they get to take one more. So that means with this, they're going to take three plus one for the jerry can. Up next, we have the white player, and I just realized I forgot to refill the survivors over here on the cargo ship during the dawn phase. And now the white player has decided they're going to take uh, this hero, and they're going to move them over to the dam. And once they land there, they're going to use this baseball bat to exert one additional pressure. So that's actually four on three to the blue player, and the blue player decides they're going to fire off one of their two rounds of ammunition to equalize that out. And now the white player can activate the area. They have a single microchip, so they can use that to uh, unlock the water filtration system, and then they're going to go ahead and grab three water from the dam. Okay, it's now back to our turn, and we have three different heroes left available to ourselves, and it's starting to occur to me that we really need to hunt these wild animals in order to have the amount of supplies that we need to actually survive. As the game goes on, and as our needs grow, as we're building out our rooms in our shelter, uh, we just need more and more food, and the way that the set collection works with these animals is going to make it so that we really need to get in and kill these animals when we can. Uh, because of that, I think we should probably get ammunition. We currently have zero ammunition. Uh, we could 
could potentially move this four over here and just kill this number four. And we already have a four, so that would get us three food. But that would only get us to five supplies total, and we need seven right now. So I think that maybe instead, let's plan a little bit for the future. Also, we have to worry about being pressured. If we have zero ammunition, then we're just going to start giving goods to our opponents, which we don't want. So let's take the four, and let's head over to the military area, and let's just take four ammunition. With that done, it's now time for Blue to move one of their heroes, and they've decided to take this level three one, and they're going to head over here to the Silent Peak. They've got three strength available, and so they're going to start by searching from the top of the stack. Looks like they get another algae pill, so that's good for them. Uh, they have two more strength abilities. They'll draw again, and that's going to get them a water. And now they have to decide, do they want to use their last strength to draw blind from here, where it looks like one of these is going to, these three is an empty cupboard, or they could pick up one of these uh, pieces of equipment. Well, when they consider that you're not allowed to have two of the same piece of equipment, that just leaves this axe and this backpack which lets you double down on the fairgrounds in the forest, and they decide they think they need things right now instead of later, so they're going to risk it, they'll flip over the next thing, and that is going to give them a canned piece of food. So, all told, that was a pretty good run into the city. They're now down to minus one on the radiation track. Next up, it's White's turn. They're going to take their level five uh, hero, and they're going to head over to the container ship. They're going to land right there. That's going to get them one survivor as well as three canned food. These all come back into their shelter, and I do believe they could take the survivor and put it here into the cargo ship uh, room in order to then get that bonus, but they've decided they want to put this over here into the airlock anyway to mitigate the amount of radiation that's coming in. Because of that, this room is not full, so it does not activate, and they don't get the bonus food. Okay, it's once again our turn, and we have two of our heroes left over, and they're both level threes. Now, we are currently in a uh, supply shortage because we decided it was a great idea to build a bunch of rooms and fill them with a bunch of survivors, and we now have to get to seven, and we just have two. So we have a couple options. We could move uh, this hero down here and try to kill off this four. Uh, that would get us three food because we've already killed a four, but that gets us to five instead of seven where we need to be. Now, we do currently have four uh, munitions because we walked all the way up there, and I feel like we should probably do this. So we're going to move, sorry, our level three right here, and we're going to head to the forest. And as you can see, it is a three, and the animal on top is a seven. Let's go ahead and spend all four of the munitions that we just picked up on the last turn. So we essentially used half of our overall round to uh, do this action. And now we can kill off this animal. And as you can see, the top level of it is going to give us uh, five meat. So that's a really nice start, especially if we are able to kill more of these in the future. Um, it's definitely a little unfortunate that we are just working so hard to kind of stay afloat. But I think that's just the hole that we've dug ourselves into. Next up, it's the blue player's turn. And they only have their level five left over. They're going to head over here to the mine. Uh, once they land here, they're going to use four out of their five strength in order to kill off this animal. They already have a four over here. So when they do this, that is going to be uh, three they're, they're going to get to grab from the kill. And with that last strength, they're going to take a single metal, but then they're going to use this pickaxe, uh, tip it to the side, and that will let them grab two more metal from the spot. So when they come back over here to their shelter, they're going to gather the meat they got for killing off this four. It's going to be a three base, but then they get two more because of this hunting room. So that's going to be five extra meat that they get to bring in to their uh, supplies. Well, when we look over here to see the amount of supplies that Blue has, we're certainly a bit envious. They have built up a big store. They're going to have no problem feeding all their people this round. Next up, we have the white player, and this is their final hero, and they've decided to head over here to the military base. Once here, they're going to spend one of their strength to flip over this token, and then they're going to grab three more munitions. This is certainly good for them, considering they had zero munitions before, and now they've pegged out on the radiation track. We've now come to the final movement of the round, and I figure let's go ahead and take our level three, and we're going to then activate our exoskeleton, which will allow us to move to any spot that we can legally go to. We still can't uh, go onto a spot where we already have that color, but it lets us go farther than two, and we're going to jump right across to the other city. Once we land there, we see we have three strength actions, so let's go ahead and draw the top two from the stack. This is going to get us a wood. This one is going to get us a computer chip, and then we can maybe grab one of these two. This one will get us an extra survivor whenever we go to cities, which is something we do pretty often. And then this one will let us go one higher on the uh, cargo ship when we go to the cargo ship, which is also something we want to do pretty often. 
I figure between these two, this one's probably a little bit stronger. Uh, being flooded with survivors might not be the best idea, considering we do have to feed them. Uh, although if we leave them in the airlock, they're pretty cheap to feed. But either way, let's go ahead and take a grappling hook. This, of course, comes in broken, and now we get our computer chip as well as our wood, and we can now use, well, uh, I guess it's the chainsaw. We didn't get to use the hacksaw. We used three out of our four pieces of equipment this round, though. I think that's pretty good. So we will uh, tilt this to the side, and then we get to take two more wood from the supply. Okay, we're now done with movement, so we can shift into the night phase, and just like last round, I forgot to mention that when the white player went to the cargo area, they were the first one to do that, so they should have taken this first player marker, and now they can start things off. Well, night phase one involves trying to overcome some of these events, and the white player gets to start. They consider overcoming the thieves. They have the stuff to do it, but um, ultimately they decide to save their stuff, and they're going to pass. It now comes over to us, and we have just seven meat in front of us, so we could uh, deal with these nomads, but we desperately need all of that meat. We spent so much work trying to get those. We don't want to just turn it into points. We want to keep our survivors alive, so we're going to pass. And finally, it comes to the blue player, and they have decided that the time has come. They're going to spend three of the vast amounts of water that they had to put out this wildfire. So when this happens, they're going to get to take this card, and that'll be worth three points at the end of the game. With that done, play now goes to the white player, but they passed. We've already passed, and it comes back to the blue player, who does have enough meat to cure the uh, Nomad event as well. But they decide they're going to save their meat for now, so we're now going to move on to night phase two. And this is where we have to feed all of our survivors. So we'll start over here with a white player. Looks like they need to spend one uh, water for the survivor in the airlock. And now they need to spend five supplies for all the people in their various rooms. In this case, they're going to spend their uh, one meat. And then one, two, three, four. They're going to go ahead and keep their water over here. So they are now fed. Next up, we can uh, take a look at our area. We have nobody in our airlock, so we don't have to spend any water on them. And then we have a requirement of seven, and fortunately, we were able to get exactly seven meat. So we will pay all of this, and we are now fine. And lastly, we have the blue player. We can see over here, they do have to spend one water for the two people in their airlock right there. And then they have to spend five, and with that, they're just going to go ahead and spend this red meat that they have lying around. We can now move on to night phase three, which is where we manage our radioactivity. We know that we're having two come in this round, so we start over here with the white player. They have a single person in the airlock, so that will reduce it to one. That means this is going to go down by one. Next up, we are over here. We have nobody in our airlock, so we're going to go down by two, bringing us all the way back to zero, which is where we started the game. And lastly, we have the blue player, and they have two people in their airlock, so they are fine. They're going to go ahead and stay at the minus one where they were. Moving on, we now have night phase four, which is where we can recruit new survivors. The white player is going to start things off, and they're going to spend one of their water in order to recruit a survivor, and they will go uh, into the airlock. Next up, we have no supplies, so we cannot recruit anybody. And lastly, we have the blue player, and they've decided to use one water and one of this canned food in order to recruit two people, and those will go right here into their airlock. We've now reached night phase five where we can build new rooms and pull people out of the airlock and put them in. The white player is not going to build any new rooms, even though they could because they do have a minus two discount. They could spend this one wood in order to get a room built, but they kind of feel like holding on to this and they don't see themselves in a position where they desperately want to get two rooms built later on. Uh, while in phase five, they are going to take one of the survivors from the airlock and they're going to put it over here into the cargo ship spot so that this is activate, activated again and they can use it on the next round. And of course, down here in this slot, this is going to activate and it's going to bring in another survivor from the outside world. It's going to go right there as just part of its ability. And now they're done. Next up, we have the option to build some buildings, but considering we have nobody in our airlock and we are maybe not going to have any next turn either, I don't think it makes sense to try and build any of these buildings. We should save all of these resources to try and get some more equipment built. Moving on to the blue player, they have decided to go ahead and build a room. They're going to spend all three of this metal in order to get this one built. Now, this is the standard one. In fact, we got this going, I believe, on the last round. They're going to flip this over, and once they fill it up, it's going to allow them to draw one piece of equipment uh, in every one of the equipment rounds, and then they get a minus one discount on actually trying to get equipment built. They're going to go ahead and fill that up, and that means their water requirement is now back to one, but they have added two to the overall requirement for their supply. This means they're currently matching us at seven, but I feel like they are in a better position to actually feed all seven of those people, or all seven of that supply anyway. Okay, let's now go to night phase six, which is equipment repair. 
First of all, we have the white player who unfortunately still doesn't have the ability to do that. Uh, they did not generate that many resources last round. I'm not too sure what happened there, but either way, they're not going to get any of this equipment built, and they're definitely lagging behind on the equipment front, so that could start to adversely affect them. Next up, we can take a look at it. And when you consider that we still have both of these rooms active, I think we're going to get some more equipment built. So let's start things off by drawing a random one off the top. It is a bow. Ooh, <laughs> this one allows us to gather a meat whenever we are in the forest. That is definitely tempting considering how hard it is for us to actually get our uh, supplies right now. So now that this is over here, we can build one of these for free. And well, when we consider that we have zero metal and all three of these have metal, we could build any of them for free and then use the other discount to get rid of the metal in order to get another one of these built. We just need to figure out what the right ordering is, and I kind of feel like this ammo box is better than I first thought. Uh, having ammunition is really good, especially when you're trying to hunt. So I'm thinking that maybe we should try and get both of these built and not worry about this grappling hook right now. Uh, this does hypothetically give you a little bit of flexibility when you're going to the cargo ship, and maybe you can get another can of food. But um, I think maybe we'll go with these instead. So uh, that means they have the same exact price, actually. So we'll do one of them for free, and the other one will do a discount of one uh, metal based off of this room right here. So that means we're just going to have to spend two wood, and we have two more pieces of equipment made. Moving on, we now have the blue player, and since they also have one of these supply rooms built, they can go ahead and draw the top piece of equipment, and it looks like it's a baseball bat. Now, it's time for them to try and build one of these, or repair one of these pieces of equipment, and I just realized that I forgot my plan earlier. They definitely should not have spent all three of that metal in order to get this room built. They should have spent the one metal and then two of these microchips. Uh, this was my plan all along, I just kind of forgot it for there for a second, so I'm going to fix things around, and now the blue player has the ability to get this bear trap made because they have a minus one discount on getting the repairs done. They have no wood, but they do have the two metal right here, so this is going to come out, and now whenever they hunt, they have, uh, well, one time per round when they hunt, they get plus one strength, which is pretty good for them. We've now reached night phase seven, and this one is simply checking to make sure that we are at or under to water, and then we have no meat lying around. It does look like both of our opponents are saving a little bit of water, but they are fine there. So with that, we can now move into the fourth day uh, slash round of the game, and we'll start with the dawn. As usual, it's now time to lay down all of the various uh, heroes in the city, as well as refilling all of the different locations. Next up, we can move into the day phase, and we of course start by revealing an event. In this case, we have Epizootic Disease. It says that Wild Game is going to yield one less meat token than normal, which is certainly not good considering how much all of us have been leaning on the, uh, the Wild Game to actually get the supplies we need. Uh, so that is going to be in play throughout the, uh, this uh, overall round. And then also, the Nomads are still here, so we have to discard three um, items from the search stacks of both cities. And of course, the Thieves are still stealing uh, out of the fairgrounds, and that's going to be three more electronic parts from there. Well, we can go ahead and evaluate that, and it is kind of nice that the wildfire is no longer raging up there, so there's going to be a lot more wood available to everybody. Uh, okay, let's see what black wood looks like. Looks like the munitions, the uh, microchips, and the wood planks are not going to be available there. And then over here at the Silent Peak, we are not going to have an empty cupboard, as well as the uh, radioactive pills for algae and wood. So uh, definitely not getting wood from the search piles, and now we can move into the uh, movement phase of the game. And it looks like the uh, white player is going to be the first one to go. They're going to start things off by uh, picking up this level 3 uh, hero. And they're going to move over to the mine. Once they land over here, they're simply going to grab 3 metal from it. And now we get to move one of our heroes. Well, considering we didn't actually use the dam last round, that means that we have the ability to jump right in there uh, right from the get-go. And I think this is probably what we should do. We do have an exoskeleton, so we could pick up with this five and head right over there and pick up five out of the nine water, which would certainly put a cramp on our opponents, and that would be five out of the seven uh, supplies that we need for the round. Uh, that means we just need to pick up two more supplies somewhere uh, throughout the round in order to make everything fine, and we'd have three more actions to do that. Now, I think when we consider, uh, we could also just move this four over here, and then we would that would free up the five to potentially go over here, which would get us an extra survivor and the last of the um, uh, the supplies we need. I guess in that case we get four water, and this would be three food, which would get us to seven. And then our two threes over here would be free to 
do something else, <laughs> like get uh, munitions or maybe just harvest some parts from various spots. I think that's probably better, especially when we consider we can save this exoskeleton for one of the threes so they can maybe jump over to one, uh, the other city or something like that to get some stuff. So let's go ahead and do that plan. And because of it, I think let's get into the dam before maybe other people try to move out and get back in there. Uh, the five was going to go over here. I guess we could check to see is any other player's five. Well, this blue five could jump over here and block up that spot. So that means we should probably do that first. There's no huge rush on the dam because both of our opponents have to leave before they can actually go back in there. So let's go ahead and activate this five. We'll head right over here. That's going to give us uh, get us one survivor right here as well as three more cans of food. Hmm, well, when we come back over to our shelter, I realize there is a slight kink in our plans because, well, this survivor has to go into the airlock, which means we now have a one water requirement. So we have eight supplies total we need to pick up instead of seven, but we could probably figure it out. We have this uh, hunting bow if we go to the forest that could pick us up a meat. I think there are a few different things we could potentially do. Now, before we move on, we do have this hacksaw. We just visited the cargo ship, so we can go ahead and exhaust this item, and that is going to get us to metal. And with that, we are now done with our movement, and blue can go. They've decided to activate their level 3 hero here, and they're going to send them over to the military base, where I realized I forgot to refresh the algae pit there. So now that that is done, the uh, blue player is deciding they're not going to activate that. They're simply going to take three bullets from the military store. Next up, it's the white player's turn, and they've decided to move over to the fairgrounds with their level 5 hero. And once they get here, they decide to expend three of their ammunition to turn the 6 into a 3, that leaves them with two extra strength to grab two of these microchips. So these bullets are now gone, and they do get to hunt this level six. Unfortunately, it's the first six that they've hunted, and due to the current event, they're only going to get three meat instead of four. Well, this means it's once again our turn, and we currently have our two threes and our four to activate. Now, we know that our four is going to go over here to the dam, but we also know that it's not a huge time pressure right now because while the blue player can get in over there, the most they could grab out of that is going to be four out of the nine. So no matter what, we will be able to go to the dam on the next turn, especially if the white player pulls out because they have to leave before they can move back in. That means we should probably activate one of these two. And I know I mentioned that we could potentially use our uh, crossbow here in order to go to the forest and collect an extra food. But that was before I realized that on both of the cities, the uh, canned food option has not been revealed yet. So there are uh, five um, left in both of those stacks. And we have two of our threes here. And I think it's a, probably a pretty good uh, bet for us to try and move into both of them uh, by essentially activating this one with our exoskeleton to go over here. And on a future turn, we can move down here with this red one here. Uh, when we look around to the placement of all of our opponent's uh, idle heroes, we can see they're kind of all over here, so it's very unlikely that they're going to be able to make it over here. In fact, I don't think they can at all. So let's go ahead and activate that plan. We're going to go ahead and use this exoskeleton. We're going to do it with this three right here, so they're going to move over to the Silent Peak. Once we get over here, I figure it's probably a good idea to look at the equipment real quick. This is an access pass for the dam. We could go there without uh, spending that one uh, microchip, which is nice. We already have a hacksaw, and this battle gear lets you once per round uh, reduce the amount of pressure suffered by two, which is also pretty good. But I think, ultimately, we probably want to dig through here more than we want uh, any of these pieces of equipment. So let's go ahead and start by drawing the top one right here. It is scrap metal, so that's going to be uh, one metal for us. We have two poles left. We've got munitions. And with one pull left, let's go for it, and we're going to really hope to find the food. And no, well, we found the empty cupboards, which is good for us, because uh, using um, that room that we have, we're going to get a wood and a metal for that. So that looks like, all told, we got two metal, a wood, and a munitions for this uh, city trip. And we're not quite done, actually, because we also have this chainsaw right here. It says that whenever we go to a city, we can use this in order to get two more wood. So that was a very effective uh, trip over there to the city, although we did not get the one thing we wanted the most, I think, and that was that one can of food. But we have one more shot of that. It's now the blue player's turn to move, and they're going to activate their level 5 hero and head over to the fairgrounds. Once they go over here, they can see that their uh, pressure is 5, and the uh, other one here is the white 5. So no uh, pressure effects are going to happen. Next up, they're going to shoot two rounds at the animal, which is going to reduce the five down to a three. And then they're also going to use this right here, which is going to be a plus one strength with the bear trap uh, when they do a hunting action. So they will use this one to essentially turn this into a two for all intents and purposes. It essentially gives us plus one strength. So that means they are going to hunt this one, and that leaves them with three strength left over. And with that, they're going to take the last of the microchips. These are going to get added into their stores, and then it looks like they've only killed threes and fours so far. So this is the first five. 
they would normally get three meat, but due to this epizootic disease, they're only going to get two meat, but they do get to activate this hunting room right here. So instead of two, they're going to go plus two to that, and they're going to gain four meat, which was a pretty good turn for them. Next up, it's the white player's turn, and they're going to activate their level three hero and go over to the forest, where they're simply going to grab three wood. With that done, it's once again our turn, and the dam is now empty, so I figure we should probably get in before all of this water dries up. So we're going to go ahead and activate our four. We're going to head over to the dam, and we do have five electronic chips, so we can discard one of them to activate the water filtration system, and then we get to grab four water for ourselves. With that done, it means it's now the blue player's turn to move, and unfortunately for the white player, blue has decided to activate this four, and they're going to head over here to the dam. Now they have this jerry can, and they also have this access card, so the access card means they do not have to spend any microchips to open up the filtration system, and the jerry can means they can take one extra water. So when they use both of these, that means this four is actually going to take five, and that is the rest of the water. So if the white player had been hoping to get in there over here with this hero, they are now going to be sorely disappointed, because there is no more water left. It's now White's turn, and this is their last uh, hero, so they have to stand it up and go somewhere. Uh, when they look at their options, they uh, can't go here and they can't go there because they already have people. So it's either the dam where it would be four next to all these other fours. And they do have this uh, baseball bat. They could apply one pressure to both of us, but um, they wouldn't be actually getting anything. So instead, it seems relatively obvious they're going to head down here to the Silent Peak where at least there are two things left in the store. And they know that one of those is going to be a food, which works out okay for them. Once they land here, before they can actually activate the area, they must apply pressure. They are going to use their baseball bat, so they're now applying 5 pressure to R3. That means that we have to mitigate that by losing 2 things. In this case, I figure, let's go ahead and fire off one of our bullets. This is actually our last bullet. And then let's go ahead and give them one of our pieces of wood to mitigate that last piece of pressure. Certainly not great for us, but uh, overall we made out quite a bit uh, by coming to the city. So I think we're still okay with our decision. And now the white player gets to go. They're going to start by taking both of these tiles off the top because they know they're going to be good. This one is going to be a food for them, and then this one is going to get them a water. Wow, okay. I guess uh, I didn't quite do the math to realize that those were the last two because you always know what the exact 10 are, but that was a really good move for them. That means they get a water and a food, which is two supplies, which is something they really needed. These are now going to go back into their shelter, and since they have four uh, strength points to use total, and they've used two of them, they have two left over, and they figure they may as well take this hacksaw as well as this access card into their spot. Now that White has completed their movement, we get to go, and we only have this one hero left, so let's go ahead and complete the plan that we had been working towards. We'll head over here into the Blackwood. And now that we're here, we're really hoping to find that food near the top, because we do like the look of at least two of these uh, pieces of equipment. This metal detector gives food when you go to the fairgrounds, which we already kind of want to do because we have a backpack, which gives us bonuses for going to the fairgrounds. Also, this uh, shotgun makes hunting easier, and as you can see, hunting is a very important part of this game. So let's go ahead and start by drawing the top tile, and it's going to be, hmm, it's metal. That's certainly okay, but now we need to consider what we want to do with our last two actions. Uh, we could just take both of these, but then one of our survivors will die. I suppose that's maybe being a little bit too greedy. Let's go ahead and dig uh, again on the stack, and it looks like, ooh, we got a water. Okay, that is going to be good enough. So that is going to make up for the one supply shortfall we have. We didn't hit a cupboard instead of this metal, but either way, uh, I think let's go ahead and stop there and now pick one of these two here. I figure, since we have a free build every single turn, and we uh, can hunt in three different locations, and the uh, metal detector only happens at the fairgrounds, we should probably go ahead and take this. So we can go ahead and finish out that move by adding all this to our shelter. Coming back to the board, we see that the last movement option is this hero right here for the blue player. They're going to head down to the mine, and once they get here, they're going to spend both of these ammunition. Now, that is going to allow them to turn this 4 into a 2, and this is a level 3 strength uh, hero, which means they have one leftover uh, strength action. So they're going to get to grab this, and then with that last strength, they're going to take one metal, which is going to be good enough to activate this pickaxe, which is going to happen when they go to the mine, which is going to get them two more metal from that spot. So these are all going to come into their area. When they take a look at their shelter, they see they've already killed two of these level fours. So that means this is the third one, which is normally going to give four meat, although the um, epizootic disease event is still happening. So they're only going to grab three meat from that. But as you can see, the blue player is actually a really good survivalist. They are very good at getting supplies in this game. 
At this point, all of our movements are done, so we can now shift into the night phase, and I once again forgot to actually move this token when we went over here to the cargo ship. It's okay. We can obviously make uh, make sure to tell who got in here first. It's easy this round. We're the only ones to go to the cargo ship, so we are now going to be the start player for this night phase and for the following round. Night phase one involves trying to overcome some of these events, and we are just barely scraping by with the amount of uh, supplies that we have. And unfortunately, all of these require supplies. I guess this one doesn't. This just needs three munitions and two microchips. We uh, have the two microchips, but we don't have the munitions, so we can't actually um, uh, overcome any of these. So we're going to pass. Now it comes to the blue player, and they have more than enough meat to actually cure the nomads thing right here. But after doing a little bit of math, they decide they're going to pass on this as well. Uh, this brings us to the white player, and they do not have enough to overcome any of these. So that means next round we're actually going to have four events happening to us. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how many of these get overcome by the end. And it is certainly nice uh, getting the victory points and stopping some of the bad things from happening. But at the same time, <laughs> using all these resources can be good for the engines that we're all trying to build with our equipment, as well as just trying to uh, recruit more survivors. Next up, we have night phase two, and in this one, we have to feed our survivors. So when we look over here, we see that we are going to have to spend one water, and then we need uh, seven more supplies. We have exactly that in front of us, so we're going to get rid of all of these. And if you're curious, this is not an option. If you have the supplies to feed your people, then you must feed them. You cannot intentionally let anybody starve. Uh, next up, we have the blue player. They need to get rid of one water, and then they have uh, seven uh, resource requirements right here as well. They're going to go ahead and spend it with the meat right here. And lastly, we have the white player. They need to spend one water and then five resources, and they have exactly that, uh, sorry, five supplies. They have exactly that left over in their cache. Night phase three involves managing our radioactivity. We know that there is two radioactivity coming in, and we have one person in our uh, airlock, so we're going to lose one on our track. Over here, the blue player is in the same situation, and so is the white player over there. Moving on, we now have night phase four where we can recruit new survivors. We currently have no supplies, so we're going to pass on that. The blue player somehow has five water left over. They're doing a really good job of making supplies. And they've decided they're going to spend three of it, which makes sense because you can only hold over uh, two water from round to round. So they're going to save these two here, and they're going to recruit three new survivors. These, of course, go into their airlock, which is going to, for the moment, increase their water needs by one. And then lastly, we have the white player who uh, currently has no supplies. You can't quite see it on screen. So they are also going to pass on recruiting new survivors. Next up, we have night phase five where we can build rooms. And I think that even though we have all of these resources, it doesn't really make sense for us to build new rooms. Uh, we did a really good job of gathering resources this round. And maybe next round, we're going to focus on gaining a lot of supplies so that we can have the survivors to actually fill some of these rooms because we only have one survivor. If we built a room, we'd move it into that room, not be able to activate it, and then have less survivors over here to stop the radiation from going up on the future turns. So we are going to pass on building a room. And that brings us over to the blue player, and they are going to build a room. They're going to spend two metal as well as one microchip, and they're going to get this munitions room going right here. So that's going to flip over, and now they're going to move three of their survivors into it. This one is going to allow them to activate it once per um, night phase five, which is where they currently are, to get four munitions, although it is going to increase their supply requirement by three. So that's going to bring them all the way up to 10 uh, supplies they need to uh, gather each round. Um, just for here, uh, right now they still have a one water requirement over there, and uh, they can go ahead and activate this. That is going to get them four munition from the supply. And I actually just realized when I look a little bit closer that I forgot about the blue player's uh, room right here, which gives them one permanent water. I wasn't considering that when they were feeding all of these people up here, which means technically they should have used that one permanent water before they consumed this one, which means they also should have spent one more because you can only store two per round to recruit another survivor. So I'm just going to go ahead and fix that. Uh, sorry for uh, little mistakes like this, but there's quite a lot to keep track of between all of these players. Lastly, we have the white player, and they have decided they're not going to do any building, even though they have the ability to build a, a room at a very uh, big discount. It just doesn't make sense for them. They're having uh, supply problems just like us, so they're not having enough uh, survivors to actually man these rooms. So why spend the resources right now to actually build the room when they could just do it on a uh, following turn? They're certainly not going to be in a situation, I don't think, to get an overwhelming amount of survivors. So they're not going to build a room, but they do get to activate this room down here, 
which is going to add one more survivor into it. And uh, this is definitely starting to fill up. They've got one, two, three, four, five, six in here. It can have a maximum of eight, and there are uh, two more rounds. So if they play this uh, out well, then they'll have the perfect amount to get a whole bunch of points. Also, they could sacrifice some of these survivors if they don't have the supplies they need in order to uh, not lose the functioning of some of their other rooms. Okay, with that, we can now move on to uh, night phase six, which is getting equipment. We, of course, get to do this first, so let's now activate this room, which lets us draw a piece of equipment. It looks like it is a chainsaw, but we already have a chainsaw in our area. That means we're just going to discard this and draw a again. Uh, this is an ammo box. We already have one of those. I guess this isn't too surprising considering how much uh, equipment we already have. Uh, next up, we have battle gear, which is going to reduce uh, pressure suffered by two. This is not something we have already, so that's going to go right there. And now we can try to repair our equipment. We know we're going to get to repair something for free, and another thing we get to reduce one requirement from, and we have a lot of all of these different resources. I suppose the thing we have the least amount of is wood, and let's go ahead and build the shotgun for free then. So this is going to go into our area. We're going to hunt better on the following rounds. And next up, I think... Well, maybe we should just get both of these going. Like, reducing pressure on one of our uh, heroes is certainly nice. It means we don't have to expend munitions as well as potentially resources to our opponents. So if we were to do that, it looks like this one requires two and this one one. Yeah, let's go ahead and do this one for our discount. That is going to cost us one wood and then one microchip. We'll do the discount on the microchip. Actually, no, we'll do the discount on the wood. We have a lot more ways. Hmm, actually, we have to go to the fairground to get microchips, and the cities get wood. Okay, I'm going to stick with my original plan. We're going to make this one for that. And then lastly, we'll go ahead and make this one for a microchip, a wood, and a metal. So we are just drowning in equipment, which is certainly a nice thing. Next up, we have the blue player, and they also have this room right here, which lets them draw one piece of equipment. It's a purifier. This is not something they have already, and this is really good for them, actually. Uh, they already have reason to go into the mine because they have this pickaxe. In fact, this little symbol matches, and when you match that symbol, that's an extra point at the end of the game. And this means when they go to the mine, they also get a water, so they're very happy with that pickup. And uh, do they actually have the ability to make it? Uh, yes, they do, because they have one discount. I guess they could actually do it naturally by spending both of these microchips and this one metal here. But they're going to just do it by doing one microchip and the metal, because they make a metal a lot better, especially when they go to the mine. So now they have even more reason to go to that spot, and they certainly do not have the ability to make this piece of equipment here. Lastly, we have the white player over here, and they have a huge amount of broken equipment. They have not been doing a good job of making this stuff, and they're going to try to turn that around this turn. They're going to go ahead and spend a microchip, a wood, and a metal in order to get this access cart built so that they can go to the dam without having to spend a microchip, which is certainly nice. And then they're going to spend a microchip, a wood, and a metal in order to get this hacksaw going, which is going to get them two metal whenever they visit the cargo ship, which they already want to do because they have this room right here, which gives them extra canned goods when they go there. Well, we finally reached night phase seven where we check our upkeep. It looks like we are not storing too much food or water and nobody else is. The blue player does have this two water right here, which is pretty good. And with that, we are now done with this round. We can move into day number five with the dawn phase. Now that we're all set up, we can move into the day phase and we're gonna start off by revealing yet another event. This one says radioactive cloud. Each shelter increases its level of radioactivity by two squares. Oh my goodness. That takes a ton of electronics, which is really not good considering the thieves are stealing the electronics. And uh, we, of course, have to affect the thief effect on the parade ground as well as the nomad effect on the cities. Well, I suppose we should evaluate those events in uh, order from newest to oldest. So that means we're going to go down two on our radioactivity track due to that cloud. The blue player goes up uh, down two as well to the minus four. We're at minus three. And then the white player goes to the minus two spot. Next up, the thieves come and raid all of this electronics from the fairgrounds. And now we can pull the three for the nomads from each city. It looks like uh, Blackwood City is not going to have algae pills, which is unfortunate considering that radioactive cloud is coming. Uh, scrap metal as well as a plank. And then over here at the Silent Peak, it looks like we're not going to have access to uh, plank, uh, algae pills once again, and a can of food. At this point, it's now time to start our movement, and we are the starting player. Now, we uh, currently need to get up to eight supplies, and we have zero. <laughs> uh, we can see that there is a seven uh, animal down here, and we did manage to kill a seven on an earlier turn, so we are somewhat incentivized to try and kill that one, and we do have a shotgun. Now, unfortunately, in order to kill a seven, well, our best hero is five, 
So five plus one is gonna be six, and it's still not enough to kill this, and we have no munitions. I think let's go ahead and start things off by moving this hero over to the military area and using this ammo box. That's going to free up the dam if we want to move into it to try and get a bunch of water. And we could get a bunch of ammo as well as maybe a algae uh, pool, a use to work on our radioactivity track. So let's go ahead and pick up the four and head over there. And when we consider the fact that we do have that radioactive cloud coming, I do think that this is worth one strength point. We'll flip this over to bump ourselves up once on our radiation track. And then we will use the other three to grab three ammo right here. And then use this ammo box in order to grab two more. So I think grabbing five ammo there and a uh, radioactivity uh, lessening is certainly a good turn for this worker right here. Well, when we consider that that radioactive cloud is going to hit us again and the radioactivity for the last two turns is three, I think we should definitely use this while we can. That's going to use one of our four strength bonuses, so we have three more. We can grab three bullets with that, and then we will utilize this ammo box, since we're visiting the space, to grab two more. That algae pool is going to bring us back to minus two, which uh, doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But when you consider we're going to get hit again, probably by that radioactive cloud. And then it doesn't look like we're going to have enough survivors to block all the radiation coming in. As you can see, the negative points get quite a lot bigger. And once you get to the skull, you actually start killing off survivors. So this is probably going to be worth at least one point for us, probably at least two. Um, but uh, I think we'll just stick with it and not try to math it out too much. Next up, we have the blue player, and they're going to activate their four hero and head to Blackwood City. Once they get here, they're going to start off by scavenging. Uh, the first thing they're going to see is a munition, so they have three more actions left. Next up is a holy water, so that's going to be a water, and they have two actions left. And they see no empty cupboards, and there are three of these uh, tokens left. So they have a two-thirds chance of hitting those empty cupboards. They figure with their last two actions instead, they're going to go ahead and take this shotgun... And, well, they figure they'll grab this metal detector right here. Next up, it's the white player's turn to move, and they're going to take this one and head over to the dam. They do not want to lose out on that water this round. Now, they were able to make an access card, so they don't have to spend the microchip in order to purify the water. Once they go there, that just means they're going to get to take four water for themselves. With White's turn now done, we could take our action, and when we look at the various options, we have our five on the cargo ship, and then the two threes on the different cities. Now, I know that I want to kill this seven right here, and I was planning on doing that with the five, but when we consider some of the other options, we could instead use a microchip as well as our uh, exoskeleton uh, suit to head over here with this five to the dam. We could take all five of that water and apply one pressure on the white player who currently has no munitions. So they'd be forced to give us a resource. I think that's a pretty good plan. And we have so much ammunition right now and a shotgun that we could still kill off the seven with potentially this three right here. So let's go ahead and do that action. We will ride over there on the exoskeleton. The white player, I don't think, saw that one coming. And uh, we're going to spend, uh, well, actually, no, we're not going to spend this just yet. We have to evaluate the pressure. So we have a five and they have a four. That means they have to give us one thing because they have no munitions. And when they look at their supply, they've decided to give us a wood. Okay, now we can go ahead and spend this microchip in order to filter out the water. And we're just going to take the rest of it for ourselves. Okay, with that done, the blue player now gets to go, and they've decided to activate this three and head over to the cargo ship. Once they land here, they're going to get to take one survivor, which is going to head, it looks like, into their airlock, and they're going to get one can of food. As soon as blue put their hero down, they get to take the first player marker. Look, I remembered for the first time, I think, in the game. Uh, so they will have this for the night phase in the next round. And now the white player does get to do their movement action. And they've decided to take this three and head over to the silent peak. Once here, they're going to start scavenging from the top of the pile. There's, oh man, an empty cupboard. Well, that gives them nothing, but that is also both of the empty cupboards. They figure they don't desperately need any of these, so they're probably just going to take two more from the stack. Looks like that is going to be a munitions as well as a metal. This means it's once again back to us, and we have just our two threes left over. I figure let's go ahead and activate our plan of heading down here to the parade ground, trying to kill off the seven and maybe get some microchips. Uh, this three over here can uh, finish out the round by going over here to the cargo area. We probably don't want to do that until the very end. We can tell that uh, we are totally safe because, well, the three spot is already taken, but we do have this grappling hook, which adds plus one to the positioning. So the three can slide into the four spot because both of our opponent's fours have already activated. So that is safe. And let's go ahead and head down here. First things first, we should go hunting. So we're going to use our shotgun to add plus one to our strength, 
and then I think we should fire off four of our ammunition. So that essentially is going to bring this down to a three with the four ammunition, and then with a plus one strength that uh, can be applied over here to kill this off for two of our attack value, which leaves us one left over with which we can grab a microchip, which is important because you have to grab at least one of these in order to activate things like the backpack because of the little plus sign right there. So this will get used, and that lets us grab two more microchips from that spot, and we, of course, get to take this seven. When we come back over to our shelter, we can now see this is our second seven, so that would normally get us six meat, but unfortunately this um, event is still going on, so we're only going to get five meat, which is still quite a lot. And we add that to the five water we already have, that gets us to ten supply, which is two more than we need for the round, so we're not just uh, barely uh, staying above water now, we can maybe actually make some headway, get some more survivors, and maybe build some more rooms, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself for now. Let's go ahead and take all of that meat, and that is going to finish out our turn. It's now time for Blue to move again, and they're going to activate this level 3 uh, hero. They're going to head over here to the forest, and once they get there, it's pretty simple. They're just going to take 3 wood. This means it's now the white player's turn. They've decided to activate their 3, and they're just going to head over here to the military base and pick up all 3 of these ammunition. This now brings us to our final movement, and we oops, <laughs> already know what we want to do. We're going to take this 3, we're going to head over here to the cargo ship, where we will use our grappling hook to add plus one to our positioning. This is the only way we're allowed to go in here to the four, even though we have a uh, level three hero doing it. Once we go there, we're going to get one survivor as well as two cans of food. And then, of course, we are going to also use this hacksaw right here. We get to use it every time we go to the cargo ship. So we'll tilt this one over, and that is going to get us to metal from the supply. Next up, we have the blue player, and this is their final uh, hero, and they're going to head over here to the mine. Now, when they land over here, they're going to use the uh, first uh, two of their strength, plus this bear trap right here, in order to kill off this level three uh, animal. It's important to note that players are only allowed to hunt one wild game per round, so they're not able to attack this one right here. This means they have three strength actions left over, so they're going to go ahead and grab three of these uh, metals, and then they are also going to use this pickaxe right here, which will allow them to get two more metal from that area. And they will use this purifier, which says when they go to the mine, they can pick up one water from the general reserve. So that is going to be a whopping five metal total there, as well as the one water. And then this uh, game tile, it's a three, and they've already killed two of these. So that means when we see they've killed three of them total, that's going to be three meat. But of course, it's reduced by one because of the current event that's happening. But then they can add to that the plus two from this hunting room. So all told, that is going to be four meat. When we come back to the board, we see the final movement is going to be the level five uh, hero for the white player. They're going to head over here to the cargo ship, and before they evaluate anything else, they have to do the pressure. Now, um, they're going to go ahead and use this baseball bat right here, so that means they're coming in with six pressure, and unfortunately, uh, both um, ourselves and the blue player only have uh, level strength uh, three heroes, so that means we're both getting pressured by three. We can start with ourselves. We were able to get this battle gear going last round, so we can reduce that three down to one, and then we have a single munition left, so let's go ahead and shoot this one off. That means we are fine, but it does mean that three pressure is coming into the blue player, and they have decided to fire off three out of their total five munitions in order to mitigate that. All right, now the white player gets to evaluate the spot. They're going to get this one survivor as well as three cans of food from the supply. Those then get added into their shelter, and they've decided to use this hacksaw, of course. It's going to get them two metal when they visit the cargo ship, so those will go right there. Well, with that action done, we have now finished the day phase, and we can now shift into the night for the fifth day. In this case, it looks like the blue player is going to be the starting player for that. As always, the first thing we have to do is try to overcome events. The blue player can start things off, but they don't even have the uh, resource ability to do any of these, so they're going to pass. Next up, the white player can go, and they also don't have the ability to do that. Uh, they certainly have the munitions over here uh, to take care of this, and they have the munitions in the water to take care of that, but they don't have the single meat that they would need to do that. And they're kind of uh, bummed about it, honestly, because they would like to do that, because four points is pretty good. But either way, white player is going to pass, and now it comes to us. 
and we do have excess meat. Uh, currently, we have 12 supply, and we only need to spend eight of it in order to feed everybody. So we could spend three of our meat in order to cure this nomads thing that would get us three victory points and would stop them from uh, ransacking the city so much. But at the same time, if we did that, then we would uh, find ourselves in a situation where we would be spending three less meat to potentially get new survivors. And new survivors are really good at blocking out radiation. And that's very good when you consider the fact that this radioactive cloud is coming and it's likely to not get um, taken care of because obviously that is just a ton of microchips and these thieves have been ste stealing them all game long. So because of that, I think we're actually going to pass. I think the three points we get from these nomads would equally at least um, equate the amount of points that we would lose by not being able to keep the door shut from the radiation, uh, radioactive uh, uh, leakage coming into our shelter. So let's go ahead and pass, and that means nobody is taking care of any of these events. And I'm not sure if this is just us uh, playing poorly or not, but that's certainly the way this game is panning out so far. Next up is Night Phase 2, where we're going to have to feed all of our survivors. We can start over here with the blue player. Looks like they have to consume two water, and then they have ten supplies that they need to feed. So as we can see here, they got one, two with a water, and then three, four, five, six, seven. And they have a permanent water being made down here, which gets them to eight. But that means they're not quite good enough. That's actually two supply that they are down. Uh, uh, ten is certainly a lot. Well, I guess um, twelve supply total is a ton to do. And uh, unfortunately, them shooting this very small level animal when they had a bunch of ammunition left was not a great situation for them. So that does mean that two of their survivors are going to have to die. When they look at their different room options, they've decided that the thing they need the least is this one right here, which is giving them the ability to draw an equipment card and then uh, build one for one less material. They currently have a lot of material, so unfortunately, these two survivors are going to be the ones that die off. Next up, we have the white player. Looks like they're just going to have to spend one water right there, and then five resources total, so that'll be one, two, three, and then four, five, so they have just one left over. Lastly, we have us, and we were very good at getting supplies this round, unlike the previous round. So we, of course, have to spend our one water and then the seven supplies right here. Well, we have five meat, so that can all go away. And then we can go ahead and use these two cans of food right here as well. And that leaves us with four water left over. We can now move on to night phase three, where we manage our radioactivity. It looks like there is three coming in, and it, the blue player has three people in their airlock. That means this token is not going to move for them. We can go over to the white player. They have two people in their airlock, so this is going to go down by one. And they now actually match, oh, not quite, with the uh, blue player. And then we over here have two people in our airlock, so we're going to go down by one. And yeah, we are at minus three, so is the white player. And blue is still a little bit um, farther up the track than us at minus four. So I guess that's one thing we have going for us over there. Next up, we have Night Phase 4, where each player can recruit survivors. The blue player has zero supplies, so they're certainly not going to. The white player has one water, and they have decided not to spend it. And then we have four water. Now, when we consider what we want to do with the rest of this night phase, I think we probably want to try and build this building right here, which is going to give us a reduction in the amount of uh, supplies or munitions or uh, materials that we need to um, overcome one of the events. Uh, the events could get us a decent amount of victory points at the end of the uh, the next round. I mean, obviously, points are certainly good. And this also has a requirement of just one uh, when it comes to affecting our uh, resource dice. So I think let's go ahead and spend all four of these so that we can recruit four more survivors. These are going to come in over here at the airlock. And then we can put all four of them down here and still have two left over to man the airlock, which will be pretty good for us. At this point, we've reached phase five, where we can build rooms as well as reorganize some of the survivors. Now, the blue player gets to start, and they've decided not to build any rooms, even though they have all of these different resources. And they could choose to move some survivors down into this area so that they could use this room in the next uh, phase when they are repairing equipment. But they've decided to leave the survivors up here to try and just uh, man the door. I mean, having that radioactive cloud come out has really affected some of the decisions we're making. Because obviously, uh, down here on the track, these are really low amounts of points that you're losing. But considering we know this is going to jump up to more, this is getting to be a very consequential area where you're getting uh, losing like two points and then two more points and then actually losing some uh, survivors as well. It's definitely an important thing to keep in mind. So they're just going to keep this one in here, but they do get to activate this munitions hold right here. That is going to get them four more munitions for the next round. 
Next up, we have the white player, and they are also not going to build a room. Maybe it was a mistake to have them build this one so early in the game. I don't think I quite fully understood the ramifications of that and how uh, having these rooms be built and unoccupied doesn't really help them out very much. So um, they're going to go ahead and activate this, though. That's going to get them yet another survivor, bringing that to seven. And lastly, it comes over to us, and I figure let's go ahead and follow through with the plan I already talked about. We're going to need to spend three resources to do this, and I figure we should do all three of them uh, with metal. Uh, it appears that electronics is one of the most scarce resources in the game due to those thieves that keep uh, going after the parade grounds. And when you consider we have no equipment right now, and we'll get to draw one and then build one for free, we don't really care to have this stuff around. So we can flip this over, and then we can man it with all four of these survivors. And when we do that, that's going to make our uh, water usage go back down to one, and this is going to increase our overall supply by one. So that puts us at eight total there. Also, we need to keep in mind that we're going to get victory points at the end of the game for our completed rooms. We just went from three completed to four completed, so that is two to four points. So positive two points at the end of the game for us, as long as, of course, as we can keep these rooms filled up. We've now reached night phase six, where we can repair equipment. The blue player gets to start things off, and they no longer get their discount over here, but they have decided they're going to get both of these built right here. That is going to cost them three wood total. And it's also going to cost them their one uh, chip and two metal. Next up, we have the white player. And unfortunately, they can't repair anything because they have no microchips. This has really been a, uh, a key point of the game, having them be so restricted throughout the play. And every one of their pieces of equipment requires it. And they did not invest in any of the, uh, the rooms that give them a discount. So unfortunately, they're going to pass on making any equipment. And that brings us back over to us, where we have no broken equipment currently, but we do have the ability to draw one from the top of the stack. And then whatever it is, we can build it for free, and it's going to be a flashlight. Okay, whenever we go to a city, we can pick up one extra survivor. That's really not bad. And also, when you consider the fact that we have this chainsaw, this little symbol matches up, and that is going to be a bonus one point at the end of the game. So, pretty good. We finally reached night phase seven where we check to make sure we don't have too many resources. It looks like we have no supplies, blue has no supplies, and the white player over here just has one water, which is under the uh, two threshold that they need. So with that, we are now done with the night phase and we can now shift into dawn of the sixth and final day of the game. Now that we're done resetting the board in the dawn phase, we can move into the day. We're gonna start things off with an event. And as we can see, we're gonna get hit by three more radiation. And the event is Cold Snap. Uh, it's another four-pointer, and it says that each shelter loses one survivor. Oh, geez. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and evaluate these in reverse order. We'll do this one, then the radioactive cloud, and then finally uh, reducing our uh, electronics as well as our city spots. First things first, that Cold Snap is going to kill off this survivor from the blue player. Uh, it's going to kill off one of the survivors from this kind of uh, victory point survivor bank down here for the uh, white player. And then over here, we're going to kill off, I think, one from our airlock. And then we'll just try to fill that back in when we go to the cargo ship, I think. Next up, that radioactive cloud comes in and it pushes all of our tokens down by two. Then the thieves come over here to the parade grounds and they're going to steal three of these chips. And we can now see what the nomads are going to ransack out of Blackwood City. Let's see, it's going to be an empty cupboard, as well as a household appliance for an electronics, and then a wood. So electronics is even more scarce, it looks like. And then the nomads also are going to hit up the Silent Peak over here. And that is going to be a wood, a munition, and a holy water. It's now time to start off the movement phase, and it looks like the blue player is going to go first. They've decided to pick up with this level 5 and head over to the fairgrounds, where they're not going to go hunting. Instead, they're just going to clear out every single one of the electronics right from the very beginning of the round. Now, while they are here, they're also going to use this metal detector, which is going to allow them to pull a can of food out of the fairgrounds from the general supply when they visit it. Next up, we have the white player, and they've decided to use their level 4 hero, and they're going to head over to the forest. Now, once they get over here, they're not actually interested in collecting any wood. They're simply going to fire off two of their bullets in order to turn this level six animal into a four and then use their strength to defeat it. When we come back over to their shelter, we can see this is the second of the sixes that they've killed. So that's going to get them five food, of course, minus one for this disease event. So that's going to be four food right into their shelter. Okay, it's now time for us to move one of our heroes, and unfortunately, this last day is not looking too amazing for us. Uh, the first big downfall issue is that I don't think we're going to get any water from the dam. 
we already have a hero over here, so we have to move the hero out. And both of our opponents are already out, and they both get to go before we get to go again. And we can tell that they have the ability to, well, this um, uh, blue 4 or this blue 3 can move in over there and take uh, 5 or 4 of the water because the blue player has that jerry can. And then the yellow player is already poised to uh, jump in over there with either of these 3s. So I think no matter which way we slice it, there's like maybe going to be one or two water left in this dam by the time we even get another shot at going for it. Now, we hypothetically need to get up to nine supplies, and I'm worried that we're probably not going to be able to quite get there, but I do think that we need to kill off this animal. Like, this is the best way that we can get supplies right now, and we have a ton of material, so we don't have to worry too much about trying to get uh, wood and metal and that kind of thing. We really just trying to, to get food in this round. Um, now, unfortunately, the way these things are all kind of blocked, I don't think we're going to be able to get over here to the cargo ship either, which is really unfortunate because it has food on it. Now, in order to actually kill this seven, we need munitions, and we currently have zero munitions. Um, that means that we need to try and get some munitions somehow. Now, hypothetically, we could move this one out of here, uh, potentially even to like this city, and we potentially pick up one munitions. So that's would not quite be enough. I guess it would. If we were able to grab one munition from the city with this hero, then we could use our um, our exoskeleton to move this five down here and have exactly enough to kill off this seven. But when we look at the stack, there are five left in here, and only one of them is a munition. So um, that would definitely be a risky uh, thing for us to do on this round because we would only be pulling three out of the top five. Now, if we were able to do that, then... Things, yeah, even if we did that, we'd exoskeleton over here, and then we'd have no way to get this four over here into the cargo ship. So I think we should probably do a safer play, and that one is going to involve actually getting a bunch of ammunition to have on hand. So let's go ahead and activate this four right here and move it down to the city so that we free up the military base so we can move over there, get some ammunition, and maybe also um, bump ourselves up on the radiation track. And then we'll have the ability to move this guy over here and kill this seven as long as we've moved this one out already. There's just a lot of uh, competing factors going on here. But either way, let's go ahead and go with this plan. One nice thing about the Silent Peak in this round is that there is still a food in there, and we have a four, so we can take all but one of these things. So as long as the food isn't on the bottom, that is definitely going to help us out. Also, both of the empty cupboards are in here, and uh, we can evaluate one of those to get extra uh, wood and metal, although we don't care about that as much anymore. So let's go ahead and start things off. We'll draw the top one, and it is electronics. Uh, we'll draw again, and that one is going to be an empty cupboard, so that is going to be a wood and uh, a metal for us using that room in our area. We have two more pulls. This one is going to be, ah, great. Okay, we got the food. So that is um, those three things right there. And now we have one more pull available to ourselves. And one option is we could grab this axe. It is the other side to the uh, bow that we already have built in our area. And if you remember, every piece of equipment is worth one point. And if we match up that symbol, then that would be an extra point. So essentially, building this axe would be a two-point play for us. Or we could try and dig down into here one more time. Now, one of them is going to be an empty cupboard, and the other one is an algae pill set. But I think this is probably going to be worth more points than that algae pill set would, especially if we uh, go into here, we have a 50-50 chance of getting nothing. So let's use our last uh, strength ability to grab this axe. We can now come back to our shelter, and we were able to get quite a bit of stuff there. That's a food, a metal, a wood, and an electronics right there. Also, while we're at it, we should probably utilize these pieces of equipment that we already have. Uh, this flashlight is going to gain us one survivor when we go to the city, and I figure we may as well do that, considering we're probably going to be killing survivors off at the end of the round. And then this chainsaw will allow us to gather two more wood from the city. And with that, we are now done with that movement. We got quite a bit of stuff for that, and the blue player can now go. Well, we're not too surprised to see the blue player activate their level 4 hero and head over here to the dam. Uh, once they get there, they're going to use their access card to be able to filter the water without having to spend a microchip, and then they're going to use this jerry can to pick up four plus one water, or five, from that spot. Next up, it's the white player's turn, and they've decided that they want to get in on this water before uh, we have a chance to grab it as well. Uh, we're not too surprised to see them activate this three. They're going to head over there, and then they're going to use their access card so they don't have to use a microchip, and then they could harvest three water from that spot. So there is one left over, but that's probably not worth heading over to the dam for. Well, it's our turn again, so let's go ahead and keep evaluating that plan that we kind of formulated at the beginning of this round. Let's activate our five and head over here to the military spot. We use one of our actions to flip over this to gain uh, one bump up on the radiation track. 
and then we're going to use the other four to take four bullets. And then I figure we may as well use this ammo box right here because we're activating the military base to so grab two more. So now we have tons of bullets available to ourselves. We can now add all this back into our shelter and then the uh, algae pool is going to bring us to the minus four spot right there on our track. Play has now come back around to the blue player and they just have their two threes left over and they've decided they want to activate this one and they're going to head into Blackwood City. Once here, they're going to start off by uh, drawing from the top and it looks like they got an algae pills for the first one. Uh, they're going to draw again and this time they pulled up a, a survival ration so it's really good uh, two picks for them. And with their third strength action, they actually want to grab this backpack because they are hoping to get it built because it fits in rather nicely with this metal detector that they already have. So they're going to add this stuff into their shelter and then their radiation track can go down to the minus six. At this point, it is now the white player's turn and they're going to activate their five and head over here to the mine. Once they land here, they're going to shoot off both of their bullets and that'll make this uh, five animal down to a three. They can then use three of their strength to kill it and they'll have two strength left over to grab two metal from the mines. When they come back to their shelter, we can see they have quite a bit of metal going on and this is the second one of the uh, five value creatures that they've killed. That means they would normally get four, but once again, this disease is going to lower that back down by one. So instead, they're going to get three more meat. All right, so with that done, it's now time for us to make our move, and we've been given a little bit of good fortune. This seven just appeared over here, and now we actually have the ability to attack one of these sevens, which is good considering we have already killed two of them, so we're going to get quite a bit more meat. And then, as our follow-up, we can move our three over here into the cargo area and get some more canned food, and that's definitely going to work out better for us. Um, if this had not been a seven, then our options would have been worse. But either way, we're going to go with it. We're very happy the white player went over here and hunted on the last round. So let's go ahead and activate this one, and we'll head over here. Once we arrive, we can apply the shotguns plus one strength to our hunting right here. That means the gap is actually going to be three, so we can spend three ammunition in order to make up for that gap and kill this animal. When we come back to our shelter, we see this is the third one, so we'd normally get seven food, although because of the disease, we're only going to get six, which is still quite a bit of supplies. When we add these into our storage, we can see that we now have seven food, which is not quite enough to match the eight that we need here. And of course, we have zero water. So um, pretty much no matter what, there's going to be some death happening in this uh, colony. It's unfortunate. We maybe should have saved that one water on the last round. Um, but we did want this to activate, and hopefully this will be worth it. Hopefully those uh, material discounts will allow us to take some of those event cards, and the points we'll get will be better than the points we're losing for uh, having some of these survivors die off. At this point, we're down to the final hero movement for all three players, and the blue player is going to have to activate this three, and they're going to head over here to the mining area as well. It's <laughs> quite a bit of stuff going on here. Once they arrive, they're going to use both their shotgun and their bear trap to increase their strength by two. That gets them from three up to five, and then they're going to use two of their ammunition to lower this down to a four. So when you add that uh, five to the four, that means they have one strength left over after fighting off this animal. And with that, they're going to go ahead and grab one of these metals. And that is going to be good enough to activate this pickaxe, which lets them grab two more. And then, of course, they have this water purifier down here, which is going to get them one water from the supply. They can now add all of this stuff in, and this is the first of the uh, six type of creatures that they've killed. So in that case, it's just going to give them four or actually three food because of the disease. But this is also the first time they've gone hunting in this round, so they can activate this hunting room. So instead of getting three, they will get plus two more to that, so five meat total. Next up, we have the white player's final hero action of the game, and they're going to activate this one right here and head over to the container ship. It's going to go into the three slot, and of course, it's going to grab the first player marker because they're the first person to go to this cargo ship. And now they can activate this right here and gain one food from the supply. When they come back over to their shelter, they're going to put this survivor into their airlock, which is going to increase their water needs to two. And then they could put this can of food here and then activate this uh, room right here. That's going to get them an extra can of food when they go to the cargo ship. And they can use this hacksaw, which is going to get them two metal from the supply when they go to the cargo ship. All right, we finally reached the final hero action of the game. We just have this three right here, and we do have a couple options. We could head over here to the forest where we could pick up some wood as well as use this bow and pick up a piece of meat. If we did that, then we would only lose one survivor in this uh, given round. 
Uh, if we went over to the city, then we could just look at the stack right there and see that there are three there, and we'll know that we would get a munition, a couple metal, and a wood, but that's not really going to do much for us. And if we came down here to the cargo ship, we would get two food as well as a survivor and two metal for using our hacksaw. Now, the thing about this survivor is that it'll push us up into the second row of the airlock. So that will also cause two people to die, but we would have a third survivor in the airlock, which will stop some radiation coming in. I think overall that makes us a slightly better place. So let's go ahead and head over here. We, of course, have to use this grappling hook when we do this to increase our position by one. This allows the three to go into the four slot, and then we will use the hacksaw as we actually activate this. So we'll get two food, two metal, and this survivor. As I mentioned before, the survivor is going to go into the second level of that airlock, bringing our dependency up to two water that we do not have at all. And then we can add a couple metal here, as well as the two food. And with that, we are now done with our last hero action of the game. This means we can now shift into the night phase for the round, and the white player is the starting player. Now, they can start by overcoming one of these if they like, and they have decided to overcome the nomads. They're going to spend the three food required, and that is going to get them three points at the end of the game. With White now done overcoming this one, it continues in player order to us, and we are in a pretty good spot because we have a lot of resources and we actually have the ability to do every single one of these. Now, it would be best if we were able to do two out of these four, and considering we're going to pick and then blue will go, then white, and then back to us, there is that possibility. We also have that room which will reduce um, the uh, supply uh, cost by one or the materials or munitions cost by two on one of these. And I think if we go ahead and pay full price for this radioactive cloud right now, we will still be in a position to uh, do any of these three right here as long as we have that discount uh, with the room that we have available to ourselves. And that means that no matter what our opponents do, we're going to be able to grab a second one. So we're going to take this one and that'll be four points at the end of the game. After that's done, the blue player now gets to go, and they've decided to overcome the thieves. They're going to spend three munitions and two electronics to do that. Next up, we have the white player again, and they're going to overcome this cold snap. They've got the four metal and the two wood to make that happen, and that's four points for them. And this means it's going to come back around to us, and we could go ahead and overcome this disease, which has been definitely a pain for all of us throughout the last three rounds. We're going to use our three ammunition, uh, one meat, and then we're going to use that one uh, room that we have to overcome the one supply of water in order to overcome this, get the four points. And I'm actually surprised, but we were able to clear all of these events off just here at the very end of the game where they won't actually be activating anymore. Okay, we've now reached night phase two where we have to feed all of our people. We'll start over here with the white player and it looks like they have to put two water in for the airlock and then they have five uh, of the regular supplies they have to do for the rest of it and they'll just go ahead and do eh, two canned food as well as three meat. And then next up we come over to us and unfortunately we are missing the two water that we need. Now we certainly don't want to take out the people from the airlock because they are currently blocking the radiation from coming in. So when we look to uh, the other things, I guess we could pull them off of here considering we've already used this building. Uh, we use the benefit of that to overcome these events. So unfortunately, both of these survivors die. But then fortunately, we have uh, eight more supplies that we need and we have exactly eight more supplies left over. So all of this is going to go away. Lastly, we have the blue player and they're gonna have to, of course, spend the two water for the people in the airlock. And then they have 10 more resources that they have to spend. But fortunately for them, they have 11 total. So they'll go ahead and spend all but one. We've now reached night phase number three, where we manage our radioactivity. But as you can see, all three of us have three people in our airlocks. So we're all able to block all three radiation coming in. So no one's uh, tracks have to move. We can now move on to phase four, where each of the players can recruit survivors. The white player is indeed going to spend all three of these supplies in order to recruit three survivors from the stock. And then it looks like the blue player is going to do the same thing, spending this one water to recruit a single survivor. Next up, we have phase five, where the players can build out their rooms as well as activate some of them. Uh, the white player is going to go first, and they are going to use this room right here, which gives them a discount of two on building their first room. They're going to use this one metal to make that happen, and they're going to build this room right there. And then they're going to build one more room, spending all three of this metal. And realistically, it doesn't matter to them which of these rooms they're going to be building, as long as it has three slots in it and not four, because they want to get all of these people in so that they are completed and they can get more points at the end of the game. So they'll go ahead and do this one. It says immunity to all events affecting your tribe. 
That certainly would have been nice at earlier points in the game. Maybe they should have considered making that one happen, but they didn't, so that's going to go right there. And now they can repurpose all of the people in their airlock to go over here. And just like that, they have increased their number of completed rooms by two. And of course, they get to activate this room down here and add one more survivor to it. Okay, now it's our turn to do some building, and we have a ton of resources left over. I definitely think uh, we over-prioritized gathering resources, considering we were not able to liquidate them, and they aren't really worth anything at the end of the game. So uh, let's go ahead and build one of these. In fact, I think this one is going to be really good for us, because it allows us, during this phase, to reduce our radioactivity track by one. So we're going to flip this one over, and that, of course, costs three resources. We could do, I guess, two wood and then one metal, and now... We can move all three of these survivors down into that spot and then activate it because it is currently the fifth phase. That's going to lower this token just like that, and I think we're now done. Lastly, we have the blue player, and they don't really feel the need to build any of their rooms. Uh, none of them are going to help them out at this part of the game, but they can take three people from the airlock and put them into this room that they built already and then unfortunately killed everyone out from. Uh, they do get to activate this right here, which is going to get them four munitions, and these are the second or third tiebreaker for the game, so they may as well take it, even though it probably won't actually matter. At this point, we've now reached night phase six, where we can repair equipment. Now, the white player is going to start off, but even though they have four in front of them, they have zero resources. They completely cash themselves out, deciding to overcome these events instead of getting one of these built out, even though it would have actually matched up with a uh, symbol that would have just been one plus one for the bonus or two points, as opposed to uh, overcoming a four point event. Uh, so they could actually draw a card, uh, an equipment card from the top of the stack, and I guess they may as well. Uh, hey, look, it's an ammo box, but they still cannot actually repair this. We are next up in line, and we are very good at equipment, as we know. So let's go ahead and start things off by drawing the top piece of equipment. It is battle gear, and we already have one of those, so we're going to discard it and draw another one, and it's a crowbar. We don't actually have one of these yet, and now we've got quite a bit of resources and the ability to probably build both of these, actually. Uh, we can use this one right here to just build a uh, an equipment for free. So that'll be this one. And then for this one, we get a one discount, even though we don't necessarily need it. But let's go ahead and use it. We'll take one wood and one metal out of our reserves to do this and do the discount on that one metal. And then this can go into our stack. Lastly, we have the blue player, and unfortunately, they were not paying too much attention and didn't realize that even though they get a discount on one of their pieces of equipment, well, all of the equipment they currently have only takes wood, and so they have no wood, but they do get to draw one from the top of the stack, so maybe they'll get lucky and be able to build this one. It is a uh, thermal sensor, and they actually do get lucky, yes. They can now use this and use the one discount on the wood. They can then spend this one microchip and this one piece of metal, and that is going to be built for them. We finally reached the last night phase seven where we just make sure that we're not hoarding too many resources. Looks like nobody has any uh, supplies at all. So we can now move on to the end of the game. At this point, the game is officially over and each of us needs to add up all of the uh, survival points that we have. Now, uh, technically what's supposed to be happening here is the uh, shelter that was the best at survival is going to be picked up by a ship that's coming around to take only the best of the best to a little utopia in this post-apocalyptic land and the other two are going to have to hang out in their shelters and try to survive on their own. So with that being known, let's now start counting our own survival points and see what we have. Let's once again consult our handy uh, point summary card. The first thing that's going to happen is the points we got for events. We overcame two of them for eight points total right there. Next up, we're going to get points for our fully occupied rooms. Well, we built five rooms in our shelter, but this one is not fully occupied, so that's only four right there. When we look at the graph, that is going to be four points for us. Next up, we're going to gain or lose points based off of the radioactivity. Our marker is at minus three. Uh, after that, we're going to get one point for every survivor that we have in our shelter. Well, we've got uh, three, six, nine, twelve, uh, thirteen, fourteen total survivors. So that's fourteen more points there. Uh, keep on going down this list. We're going to get one point for each repaired piece of equipment. When we look over here, we've got uh, three, six, nine, twelve pieces of equipment. And finally, we're going to get one point for each matching pair of equipment. And in this case, that is going to be one, two, three, four. And when we add all of that up together, we end the game with 39 survival points. Okay, next up, let's see what Blue did. Starting up at the top, it looks like they have six points in events. Next up down here, they've got one, two, three, four uh, full rooms. So they're also going to get four points for that. They're going to be losing six points, unfortunately, for them off of the radioactivity track. 
Uh, next up, they're going to get points for their survivors. It looks like they have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Uh, added on to that, they're going to get points for their repaired equipment. They've got 3, 6, 7, 8 pieces of equipment. And finally, they have 1, 2, 3 bonus points for the matching pairs. And when we add all that up, they only have 28 survival points. And lastly, let's take a look at white. To start, it looks like they got 7 points from their events. Next up, they have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 completed and full rooms down here. When we look back at this chart, that is going to be worth 7 points to them. Uh, moving on down, they're going to get uh, minus 6 points for their radioactivity gauge. Uh, then they're going to get 1 point for every survivor they have, and it looks like they've got uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Way more survivors than the rest of us. Uh, after that, they're going to get points for their uh, equipment, but this is where it's a big difference for them as well. They only have 3 points there, and they have no points for matching pairs. And when they add all that up, it looks like their grand total is 31 survival points. So that means that we actually win the game with 39, and I guess we're able to get carried off into Utopia, and both the uh, blue and white players have to continue to try and survive in the post-apocalyptic wilderness, and that is going to complete one full game of Outlive. Well, I hope you enjoyed this playthrough. I was certainly not expecting us to win by even such a large amount while we were playing the game. In fact, I felt like in the middle of that game, we were not doing very well at all. I mean, we were definitely focusing on getting equipment and uh, we were not getting survivors and we were certainly not getting supplies as well as some of the our, our opponents. But what I didn't really expect was how important the equipment would end up being to the end game. I really think that uh, by getting those rooms to get those discounted or free pieces of equipment and then really focusing on making that happen every turn, um, that's kind of where we were able to win this one. Uh, our opponents obviously trying to go for slightly different strategies. The blue player was uh, trying to go really hard on supplies, like uh, be a really good hunter, and they did a pretty good job of that, although obviously they fell short by um, on the scores at the end of the game. And then the, uh, the white player I was trying to have them go really hard on like a room strategy. Obviously, they had one room that scored them a whole bunch of survivors, but they kept missing out on getting that equipment repaired. I kept, I don't know, not prioritizing that enough. And obviously, equipment gives you a bunch of victory points as well. I'm sorry, survivor points. <laughs> but um, also, it just makes all of your actions, um, well, each one of your piece of equipment makes an action more effective out there on the board. So the more pieces of equipment you have that you can use once per round, the more likely you are to get uh, much more efficient uh, activations out there on the map. So I think in general, we definitely had the best strategy. I feel like uh, in future plays, I will definitely try to um, uh, always focus on equipment. Like it's obviously a very important thing, not that it's like uh, the only way to necessarily win, but I think you cannot ignore equipment like the white player did. Um, although it, honestly, the scores were not um, that far apart between our two opponents and uh, not that far from us either. Um, I guess the last thing I want to say is uh, I was surprised at how puzzly this game ended up being. Uh, this was actually the first time I played this game. I'm really glad that um, the Patreon uh, pledges decided to vote for this game because it, it forced me to get it off the shelf, learn it, and then play through this playthrough. And I think that um, a lot of the things that are going on here where you're trying to figure out um, where you are going to be putting your heroes down so that realistically you don't block yourself um, is the crux of the game overall. And I wasn't really expecting that going in. Um, I thought it was going to be a little bit more like a regular worker placement game where you'd occasionally beat people up and take resources. But realistically, I found that um, I was often my own worst enemy, just being in my own way when I wanted to do things out there on the map. So I think uh, that all came together pretty well. And overall, I think this was a pretty good playthrough. And I think that's everything I have to say about it. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support the channel, please check out johngetsgames.com support to see all of the details about how to do that. Also, if you'd like to see more full game playthroughs like this one, as well as in-depth board game reviews and vlogs, please subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.